No, we make no breaks today. <laughs> so good, good morning also from my side. And so let's start now, maybe to break a bit the ice, I needed to put a cover on this presentation. And so I decided to go for this and you will see uh, what this is in the next slides during the presentation, but you may imagine this is a forest height maps in a particular forest in mangroves forest. And you will see that this uh, height, it's a forest height, it's a product that you easily get with this polarimetric cell interferometer. Of course, I could have started actually with this. So this is an historical cover. So I think many of tutorial presentations from Costas were starting with this slide. And you see there are two planes. These two planes, they basically realize an interferometric acquisition. And it's also an, a polarimetric acquisition, but the message here is that the, 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 your waves here, they travel um, from the, basically from the radar down to your forest volume, your vegetation volume, and then they come back. And when they come back, since they, they, of course, this depends on the frequency that you are transmitting, but when they come back, then they bring information about the volume. Actually, they bring information about the three-dimensional structure of this volume. Of course, in the way in which this structure and all the vegetation elements that you have here are seen by electromagnetic wave. And using interferometry and using polarimetry, I think you have seen something already in the past two days. Uh, using this two allows you to separate the different scattering mechanisms on the one side, on the other side to locate them in height. And uh, here you have this example with a forest, with a forest volume, but also with agricultural volume. What is missing here, there are also other kinds of volumes. So you have ice volumes and why not even sand volumes like in deserts. So in principle, the idea is that uh, with interferometry and with polarimetry, then you can uh, extract structural information about volume scatterers by separating the different contribution. And, okay, so, we say that the waves, they propagate through the volume, they come back, the result is something like this. So it's a SAR image. I guess you have seen several up to now. This SAR image you see, it's a brightness image. So what is dark, it doesn't backscatter a lot, still backscatter, but not a lot compared to what is brighter here. And here you can recognize maybe a few things. So that's, a forest here that's a runaway because here there is a small airport and what is this you have buildings and this is actually one of the i think it's the very first or one of the very first airborne polincer acquisitions and tomographic acquisitions that was done in 1998 in Oberfaffenhofen. so dlr this is dlr what you have here and this is the building where i normally sit so the building is still there, is exactly in the same way as it was in this image. So just the things around it change it. But what you see here, of course, you see that uh, in principle, uh, it's true that you have these different scatterers. If you know the place, for instance, you can also guess, as I told you before, that this is a forest and these are buildings, but by itself, just from brightness, this may not be uh, easy. So depending on where you are. That's one aspect of the story. There is the other aspect. The other aspect is that, of course, you uh, realize this image by a focusing process. And at the end, what you get, you get resolution cells. And the idea with polarimetry and with interferometry is actually to go inside the resolution cell and to try to separate scattering mechanism inside the resolution cells. And then from here comes polarimetry. With polarimetry, basically, you change the way in which you transmit and receive the electromagnetic waves and what you can, and therefore you can realize a, a, a scattering matrix. And then from here, 
with the data that you have, you can go ahead and um, in principle apply some of the composition techniques and from this decomposition then get the information that you need. And this is one example. So a typical representation, it's a Pauli decomposition. And now you see that those targets, those uh, scatters that before they were just black and white. Now you associate something a, 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 a higher information to them. So you see that these scatterers here that were white here, they actually become greenish. So this means that there is a certain scattering mechanism associated to them. While this one here, they, they become a bit pink. So that they have, a, in principle, you know that this is a Pauli decomposition. So what they have, it's a mixture between uh, surface scatterings, the hydral scatterings, and in general, also something a bit more complicated. But of course, so this is just a representation, but as I say, then you can take uh, these images, apply the compositions, and with it, separate the scatters, but still inside the resolution cell. So here, you are at the resolution cell level. So you separate among different resolution cells in range and in azimuth. Here, you fix the resolution cell and you separate scattering mechanism. This is one possibility. So you just need one acquisition and many or two or four polarimetric channels. There is also the other options. The other option is actually, and here you can do this game also with one uh, polarimetric channel, but then you need two acquisitions which are separated in space. So you need what you, on Monday you have called this baseline. So, but you need a, a spatial separation between them so that you can locate the scattering mechanism that you have in ground, you can locate it in height. And this is again, because you exploit the phase difference between the two images within the resolution cell. So again, interferometry is a way to stay in the resolution cell. And what you lose with respect to polarimetry in this sense is the capability to distinguish among the different scatterers, but what you gain is the capability to allocate them somewhere at a certain height. And now the game comes. So Polinsar basically takes the best of both. So Polinsar unifies. So this, uh, this uh, ability to see inside the resolution cell, but on the one hand, to separate scattering mechanism, and to the, on the other hand, to, um, to locate both of them in height. And we will see this now uh, during this morning, how this is possible. But maybe just to, uh, just to uh, start simple, let's see it with an example. So this is basically the very, very basic definition of Polinsar. Now with an example, so let's try to compare now interferometry and polarimetry. Now we are inside the resolution cell. So what you have, so let's suppose that you have a scene that has some very simple scattering mechanisms. You have two scattering mechanisms. One is this composed by these spheres. So something very, very canonical scattering mechanism. So one is spheres, the other one are dihedrals. So this is something that doesn't exist in nature, but it's nice to have it here as an example, just to see the concept, how it works. So that these two, uh, they, so when you make a, an acquisition, then these two, they will um, overlap within the same acquisition. So, and therefore, suppose that you have now an interferometric acquisition, then you have here, you have your, uh, suppose that you acquire HH, now, what do you have in HH here? So you have a contribution from the dihedral, you have a contribution also from the sphere, and therefore you have the two of them all together in the first acquisition and the second acquisition. Now you calculate the interferometric phase. You just take these two images. You make, maybe I could make like this. So basically, yes, you take the two images, you take the one, you multiply by the complex one, you get to the other, and you take the phase. And when you take the phase now, in principle, 
this is what I was telling you before. So now you get their height. So from the interferometric phase. And now here, these are the two scat, the two scat errors here. So these are your dihedrals, your sphere. They are a different height. They will have a certain power ratio, doesn't really matter. But in general, you will find that their phase center. So they, their location in height is somewhere in between. So this is what interferometry does. So doesn't it doesn't interferometry doesn't know what you have, but knows where you are. And now polarimetry. With polarimetry, it's a bit different. Now you don't have a second image, you have just the first one. And now suppose that what happens if so you have to consider now how these two scatterers, two different types of scatterers, they um so how their scattering is distributed across the different polarimetric channels so you go into the scattering matrix so the s matrix you have here in principle both of them they have no contribution in hv but they have contribution in hh and vv so then you have the dihedrals basically you have a 180 degrees of phase difference between hh and vv and then for the spheres, you have basically they have the same phase. And this tells you that, for instance, you take for one acquisition, now you take the sum of HH and VV. What happens? So basically, if you take the sum, the dihedrals, they cancel. But the spheres, they are there. You see. And now you can take the difference and comes the opposite. Now you have the dihedrals, but you cancel the spheres. So that's the principle of polarimetry, basically. So of course, this is an easy example, but it tells you that just by playing with this, by taking your polarimetric channels and combining them in an appropriate way, then you can select the one scatterer or the other. So what happens now with polarimetric interferometry? I said, now you take polarimetry. With polarimetry, basically, you can select the scattering mechanism, and with interferometry, you can find where it is. So now you take, you have the two images. So you have image one and image two. So you have your interferometric acquisition. It's also polarimetric. And now you remember that if you like to take the sphere, you can just take the sum of HH and VV. So you take the first acquisition and you take the sum. And therefore you have the contribution of the sphere in the first one. And then you take the second acquisition, you take again the sum, and you have the contribution of the sphere in the second acquisition. And now you have found the two polarimetric channels that speak the same language. So they, 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 they have spheres. And therefore, then you take the interferometric phase, and now you have the phase center here. So this is where the spheres are. Now you can make the same, of course, now with the dihedral. You don't need to take the sum, you take the difference. And again, now you have two polarimetric channels at the two extremes of your interferometric baselines that have only dihedrals. And therefore, it, 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 uh, it turns out that in principle, now you can make your phase and you have the, 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 the location of the dihedrals. Of course, you can make this absolute. This is one possibility. So you, you have now two DMs you can get. You have the DM of the spheres, you have the DM of the dihedrals. But you will see that in polar in polyincer, what really matters is the difference, the phase difference. So, and this is what you basically you have here. So at the, with these two polarimetric channels. So that's the basic idea uh, where we like to start. And now we need to define also which is our measurement. So what do we use in polarimetric interferometry? Basically, we use coherence, the concept of coherence. And this is, you have seen it already several times in the past two days. And uh, this is what we will use today too. So in principle, you know that you can calculate polarimetric coherences, of course, in a polarimetric configuration. You can calculate it in an interferometric configuration. And now you have to make the same in Polinsar. What changes? So in polarimetry, so you are on the one end of your interferometric baseline. And in principle, you combine polarimetric channels. In interferometry, you are in the same polarimetric channel and you combine 
the two extremes of the baseline. In Polinsar, you mix everything. Now you can combine, for instance, polarimetric, different polarimetric channels at the two extremes of the baseline. And then you have your polarimetric interferometric coherences. And uh, they have a meaning, of course, and uh, we will see it later then how to use them. But what is important now to remember, it's the fact that depending on the coherence that you have, you also have a different quality of your phase measurement. So how do we see this? Well, in principle, no matter what is the coherence, so you can be a polarimetric, interferometric, and polarimetric, interferometric, you can represent this coherence on the unit circle, on the complex plane. You have here the real axis, the imaginary axis, and uh, you have here, for instance, these three types, these three coherences. So one is a coherence with the, it's called a correlation coefficient. Sometimes you also find that as a coherence magnitude. So is a coherence magnitude here is one. So is the maximum that you can have. And then the second one basically has a phase difference between the to the first one and the, 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 the coherence magnitude is slightly lower. The third one, then you change again phase and also the, you change also coherence in the sense that here the coherence is very low. And now, of course, you can calculate the, with which variance you can locate these points. So, and therefore you will have a variance. So depending on what, you remember, you have now to estimate this coherence. To estimate this coherence, you need looks. So it's a statistical process. You need to characterize it. You need looks. What you normally need, you, um, you find them in the image itself. Uh, but independently on the way in which you estimate, then the quality of your estimate depends here on the number of looks. So on the number of samples that you use to make this, to calculate this average and to get this coherence here. So it depends on the number of looks, but also on the, uh, basically on the coherence magnitude. So, and therefore your ability to locate your coherence in the radial direction so in terms of the coherence magnitude, depends on the coherence magnitude itself. And now you see you have here, for instance, this coherence here, which is one, basically you can locate it perfectly, no matter how many looks you have. But you have a if you have a scatter that gives you a coherence one, then you can locate it perfectly on the coherence plane, on the, yes, on the complex plane. This here intermediate, gives you a variance in the radial direction. Of course, if you reduce uh, even more the coherence, then this variance here, this uncertainty that you have basically increases even more. The same is also for the phase. So again, here you have a point with maximum coherence. You can also locate it very well in your radial direction. So your phase estimate is perfect. Here with this intermediate coherence, you have a uncertainty, but still you can live with it. But now here in the moment that you reduce the coherence, then your uncertainty increases even more. But, uh, and in general, depending on how small is this coherence, then this determines your ability of using the phase information or not. So, and then if you cannot use the phase information, then you have one parameter less, in your measurements, if you have one parameter less, then it becomes more and more difficult to use models and to uh, invert physical parameters. That's a bit the horizon. And uh, now, of course, what you would like to have, so you have one possibility to reduce this uncertainty here on the phase. One possibility is to increase your number of looks. Okay, but if you cannot do this, then you need to increase the coherence. And this might be easy or might not be easy. So, and in particular, now you understand uh, this is why this introduction. This introduction for me, it's important because it allows you to understand why interferometry becomes important for volumes. 
typical volumes. They don't have a coherence of one, they have a lower coherence. And this is also, for instance, if you have a polarimetric acquisition and you calculate the coherence between HH and VV. So now here you have the Pauli. From, from the Pauli, you understand that in this scene, you have here, for instance, some fields, so more or less bare fields. And then here you have forest, so a volume. And now here, if you calculate the HHVV coherence, of course, you can distinguish what is soil and what is forest, but then what happens? Inside the forest, you cannot do anything or almost anything. Why? Because this coherence here, it's here close to the center of your complex plane. So this means that you work where? You work here. And if you work here, then your phase uncertainty is very large. You lose one parameter. What happens with interferometry? For surfaces, you have no problems. So you are here. So in surfaces, polarimetry that still gives you, a, a com, let's say, so, a rather complete observation space. Now, if you bring interferometry into the game, and now you consider interferometric coherences, then, for instance, you take a rather small baselines with a rather small base then you see your this image is white white means high coherence and you have it both on the surfaces and on the volumes so in principle you are working here so now so the surface stays basically on the unit circle or close to the unit circle and your volume is somewhere here in between but for instance, with this baseline now, you are not here in the center of the, of, the, of, the, of the unitary circle, but you are somewhere here closer to the border. So this means again, eh, now your phase now makes sense. Of course, you can also change the baselines, you make it longer, and your volume coherence now in the volume becomes lower. So in principle, then with interferometry, you have a degree of freedom more to optimize your coherence. So this means you can, and especially with volumes now, you are not confined here to work with low coherences, but you can, depending on the baseline, now you can choose where you like to work, if you like to work here or there. And therefore, in this case, you gain back your uh, full observation space. So I think this was a pretty long introduction. Uh, do you have questions up to now? I hope you are still motivated to stay here for the next hours. Okay, so you can interrupt it whenever you like to make questions and so on. Just don't worry. Now, we start, we enter a bit more in the details. Still, we are a bit in introductory phase. We are not... A, exploring all the details, but we like to see now with the measurements that you have clarified that in terms of measurements, we need coherences. And now we like to see with these coherences, how can we explore them towards inverting parameters? So one step back. So basically this is your typical interferometric configuration. You have the one acquisition, the second acquisition, between the two of them, there is a baseline, so there is a spatial separation. Then you can calculate the interferometric coherence. Okay, until here, nothing new. This interferometric coherence, now you can decompose it in different contributions. So you may have a temporal contribution, which depends on the change of your volume uh, between the two acquisitions. So you may have these two acquisitions at the same time. So your volume is the same. And this gamma temporal here is one. Or you may have some time between the first and the second acquisition. And depending on the wavelength, then you may have... Uh, uh, so depending on the time and depending on the wavelength, you may have uh, uh, a more or less destruct destructive effect. Of course, you may have the case in which this gamma temporal is equal to zero. So your interferometric measurement makes no sense. So you, you just cannot use it. But whenever it, it is you know, between zero and one, 
then you still have a way to use it. So, and then you have here, basically the gamma SNR. Gamma SNR is the decorrelation which is brought by the fact that you have noise. So up to now, we were working in the case in which, you know, everything is perfect. The system works nominally, there is no noise, but in reality, you may have noise. And this noise basically gives you a reduction in coherence with this gamma SNR. If you characterize your system, you can compensate for it. And therefore, if you are in the lucky case if, that you don't have gamma temporal, you have the gamma volume. Gamma volume is the decorrelation that it's introduced by the fact that with this baseline, you are seeing this, the elements here in this volume, basically from two different um, point of view. So with a different of viewing angle, which is introduced by the baseline. And this gamma volume, you can express it like this. I think you saw this equation already at least on Monday. So this gamma volume, this equation here tells you that if you take the vertical reflectivity function, so the vertical reflectivity function is, it has many names, you will find it across papers with many different names, but the concept is always the same. So the vertical reflectivity function tells you which is the distribution of the backscattered power along height. So it's a profile. It's what then tomography will give you. And if you take this vertical reflectivity function, this is linked to the volume coherence by means of this Fourier integral. So that's, I think this is uh, the, the, the basic relationship of today. So we move, so we use this and we develop this. So you have this, uh, you have this, this uh, Fourier relationship. The complex exponential that you have here depend on this, on this quantity here, which is the vertical wave number. And the vertical wave number basically depends on the baseline. You see here, you have this delta theta. Delta theta is the difference of incidence angle that you have from this point to this point. So in principle, it's the difference of the angles with which you are looking at the same pixel. So remember that now we are, whatever you see from here on, we are basically pixel based. So, and uh, it depends on the geometry. And we will see later that this has something to do also with the interferometric phase. But what is important then to, 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 to say is that if you have an interferometric acquisition, basically you can reconstruct the vertical reflectivity function by simply uh, considering the interferometric coherences for all this interferometric acquisition. So, and we will see now, for instance, that what you can do, you can, for instance, change the baseline. So suppose now that you start with a capacitor. So you have one baseline, one baseline gives you a capacitor. So a capacitor basically gives you one point here. If you plot here the behavior, of your coherence as a function of the baseline, or basically as a function of the vertical wave number, capacitor, then you find a point here. Then what happens if you change baseline? Suppose that you make it longer. If you change baseline, you make it longer, you make this difference of viewing angle larger, and then your vertical wave number increase. And uh, if it increases, you will sample a point somewhere here. And now you can make it even longer. So basically, again, you make your baseline longer, your difference of uh, viewing angle becomes larger. If it becomes larger, capacita becomes larger, and therefore you have a point here. So there are two things here that are important. The first one is that, of course, in the the Typical and regular behavior is that if you increase the difference of viewing angle of your volume here from the using the interferometric baseline, the coherence reduces. Because when you propagate through the volume, you see different, different distribution of scatterers along the propagation path. So therefore, if you change the view, 
you change also how uh, so you increase also the difference or decrease or decrease the difference of this distribution across this propagation paths the second thing is that now if you collect many many of these acquisitions so you have many many coherences in different points here then you have many of these points and then in principle you are sampling this behavior and what you have you basically have samples of this Fourier integral so you measure this you measure the coherence if you have many of these samples then you can now start to think to revert this Fourier integral so and this is tomography in the end it's tomography if you make it with the imaging it's still polinsar if you use models and you characterize your volumes with a number of parameters we will see later what this means and um, for those of you that of course they are a bit more as, as to say they are they know a bit more about Fourier analysis then they also realize that basically these vertical wave numbers they are spatial frequencies in the end so you have a a spatial domain which is the height domain and then you have a spatial frequency domain which are the wave numbers so this is just an additional information but what is important to remember is that changing the baseline you change the point that you get of this coherence behavior and you change your ability to reconstruct the the, the vertical reflectivity function let's make some examples so let's start with a surface a surface basically will scatter so you transmit your wave here and then the wave come back and therefore everything is here around this height the surface height so your backscatter power comes from just one height and your vertical reflectivity function is a Dirac delta now how is your coherence as a function of the vertical wave number who likes to guess so you have a Dirac delta if you like you can put it in this integral what do you expect to get If you like maybe sorry for all the wave numbers yes it's a constant so and there you find out that for a surface of course if you compensate the, the, the if you compensate for the for the signal to noise ratio if you compensate for all the system the correlation effects etc then you find out that for a surface basically you can increase the baseline as much as you like but the coherence is always one so the coherence doesn't change let's take a volume i don't know you can have whatever shape you like for instance let's take let's take a box suppose that you have here many many scatterers and they are all equally distributed in height so this means that you have every height has the same power so your reflectivity is a box what happens to the coherences as a function of the baseline are they still constant no they are not constant anymore then of course you can and it happens what i told you before so in principle they start to decay the way they decay of course depend on the function that you have here if it's a box then it depends it's a function like this it goes down then comes up again so it's a sync function what happens if you take a smaller box smaller box means that for instance you have here trees which are shorter than before in principle it happens that you your coherence decreases still but it decreases lower so if you take the same capacitor here takes this capacitor too for a shorter vegetation you still have coherence while here you basically don't have coherence anymore but then of course it can happen that 
for instance, uh, let's say so for this tall vegetation here, your coherence come back here. It doesn't come back anymore. It will come back sometime later, eh? but a bit more far away. So, but then this tells you that in principle, you see that you have a dependence now between the volume that you have and the coherence behavior across the baselines. So this means uh, a taller vegetation will give you a faster decay of the coherence with the vertical wave number, and a shorter vegetation will give you a slower decay. So let's make an example. So this is an acquisition, I think it's Elband. And uh, so it's a forest somewhere in Sweden. It's Remnistorp in Sweden. So you see here, you have some bare fields and some vegetated areas. And uh, now this is just an amplitude image. We take the coherence. So three meters of spatial baseline. It's a very, very small capacitor. And then we increase the capacitor. We go to eight meters. And then we go to 16 meters. So capacitor now is increasing. So we are going in this direction. And you know now that in principle, surfaces, they stay constant, volumes, they go down. This is what happens here. So here you increase the baseline, you increase capacita, and you have parts of your image which are constant that stay white and parts that become black. So they get close gray and then they get close to black. And now the question is, what can we say? Can we find out just looking at these images? Can we have a guess on, you know, it's L-band, you penetrate until the ground. So you see all the volume and therefore your box or, or whatever function will be between your tree top and the ground. And then just by looking at this behavior, can we distinguish between areas? So we already know how to distinguish between uh, surfaces or bare fields and forest, can we see also inside the forest? And can we distinguish where you have a taller stance or shorter stance? Well, here, for instance, is the surface that I was telling you before. So basically here, your decorrelation is limited, remember, is limited by the signal to noise ratio. So if you have a high noise, then of course you will have some decorrelation and you will see it here, but this decorrelation is independent of baseline. So remember, you, you will still have a constant coherence across the baseline, but not one, but something lower. But still, the constant behavior will be there. So there is also one thing that I like to show you. For instance, here, if you see in the image, you see that in many places, your surfaces or, or you know bare fields tend to be brighter here than here. Can someone tell me why? To help you a bit more, here you are in near range, so you are looking almost vertical, and here you are in far range, so you look with an angle. But your brightness here for some of the surfaces changes. Why? What happens to the backscatter radiation in near range, for instance? So you mean that you have a, a larger reflection away? Where, in near or in far? In far range, exactly. So in principle, in near range, because you watch close to vertical, eh? so basically large part of what you transmit comes back. But when you increase the incidence angle, then large part of what you transmit might be reflected far away. So you have a bit this radiation pattern on the ground. Eh? But look at the coherence. I said the coherence, they, they are still white. Again, if you compensate for all the system effect, then the, co the, 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 the coherences are still equal to one, no matter where you are, near or far. 
So you have this example here in near, but you can also take this example here in far. If you take, for instance, here, here in near, you are, you know, brighter than here. But if you go in coherences, in the coherences, then you see that you have not this big change. Anyway, and here you have another example here. But you see here that in these patches, then in the moment that you increase the baseline, you have some parts of these patches that becomes uh, closer to black. So your coherence becomes closer to, or well, let's say that decreases. It doesn't go to zero here, it decreases. So, but let's compare these two. So, for instance, here, your coherence goes down. So, in principle, here you have, yeah, some still good level. Then it goes down pretty black. Here, maybe it's a bit brighter than here, not too much, but a bit brighter. Here, instead, your coherence goes down but slower than this. So where is the taller vegetation? On top or yet down? On top. And because here you are going very, you are going down very fast. While here it, you stay, so you are not going so fast. Okay. So maybe here we go ahead. It's almost too much ahead. And then, of course, you can also play this game. So the way we say, the way with which you go down with your coherence depends on your vertical reflectivity. The vertical reflectivity, among different things, depends on your wavelength. And uh, you know that if you increase the, if you decrease the wavelength, which means you increase the frequency, then you penetrate less. Therefore, people always thought that at X band, you almost don't penetrate in forests. And this was, you know, uh, somehow was a, an assumption that was taken just based on this uh, physical principle, but it was then taken and, and, uh, and thought like that. But what you see here, that is an X-band coherence, interferometric coherence, global, done with the tandem mix data. So this was done just three years after the launch of tandem mix. And what do you see? Someone can tell me what you can see. This coherence. Where is white? Where is black? For instance, nobody thought that in dense tropical forests you have a volume decorrelation. So here there is no temporal decorrelation because the mission is B static. So you acquire your coherences at the same time. System effects, they are all compensated. So this is volume decorrelation. And you see here in the Amazon, you have a decorrelation. This is volume, so it's a forest. So you have it here in the Amazon, you have here in this uh, forested areas in the US, you have here in the Northern of Europe, you have here on the Alps. Of course, here you also have other effects, especially here in the mountainous regions because of the already the slopes that can modulate the coherence. Then, of course, you have also in the desert some, co some decorrelation. This is not because of penetration in the desert. This is just because of residual SNR decorrelation, just because you do there, you don't get enough power. But anyway, you see that at all the frequencies, even at the highest one, interferometry can still give you information about the volume. And up to now, we were watching just the magnitude of the coherence. What is the phase of the coherence now? The phase is what you call it. So you calculate your coherence as before. What is called the phase centers is basically tells you, we said many times before, eh, tells you where your scatterers are located. And now a bit more precisely, it tells you, because now we have this idea of the vertical reflectivity function and of the relationship between the vertical reflectivity function and the coherence. And therefore, the phase of this, it's basically tells you what's the mass, so the equivalent of the mass center. So it tells you 
where, so the, the average position of all these scatterers, average means weighted by the airbag scattered power. So, and indeed, it's, it's uh, let's say so, it's uh, the analogous in physics if the, is the center of mass of a body. So in principle, and the phase center itself already tells you something. So it locates where the scatterers are, but it tells you also something about the reflectivity. Maybe not one single phase center, but you have many phase centers. Again, eh, you have this multi-baseline acquisition concept to revert then your, your coherences and then to get to the reflectivity. And you see here that uh, the, the phase center height. So you have the phase. So this is the phase of the coherence. It's the interferometric phase. And you go to the height using the vertical wave number. So and here, if you like, you have the usual definition of the vertical wave number. The vertical wave number is that parameter that scales phase to height. And so you have this linear relationship between phase and height. And then kappa zeta is the coefficient that it's in the middle. So this means that it provides kappa zeta, provides also a sensitivity. So you have a phase, and then depending on kappa zeta, you can get a height. On the other way around, if you get a height, depending on kappa zeta, you get a phase. So this means if you have a small kappa zeta for the same height, you get a small phase. But for the same height, if you increase the kappa zeta, you have a large phase. So this means now that if you like to see height differences, what do you need? To see the smaller height difference, you need a small capacitor or a big capacitor. You need to be sensitive. So you need a big capacitor. You understand? But then you remember that the big capacitor reduces the coherence. And if you reduce the coherence, your phase standard deviation increases. So you increase your uncertainty in the measurements of phase. So you have a bit this trade-off. You need to, to define which kind of high difference you like to see. And then based on this, you can dimension your baseline. But still the baseline in interferometry is this parameter that allows you to control the sensitivity and allows you to, how to say, to control also the performance with which you like to get your parameters. Good, but if you see here now, coming back to the phase center, so just to show you an example, the phase center, of course, depends on frequency. Now, this is a, a tomographic profile of a forest. Polarization is a change. Now, uh, you can change frequency. So here, for instance, you have the ground. Here you have the top of the canopy or somewhere close to the top of the canopy, depending on the stand, your scattering contribution might be located more close to the top or around the ground or, or, or between the top and the ground. Um, now what happens? Now you change frequency, for instance, and you may get something like this. So it's the same forest. So nothing happened in between these two acquisition. But now you see that your scattering, your reflectivity function, basically has a peak and it's dominant close to the ground. Yeah? While here, for instance, the volume is not so dominant anymore. But you can also change frequency again. And you get here now a reflectivity with a dominant contribution close to the top and almost nothing on the ground. So suppose that here you have a phase center height. Here, for every pixel, you have a phase center height. What happens here? Your phase center height is higher or lower? Sorry? It's lower. And what happens here with respect to this? Higher or lower? Higher. So you see that the, these measurements of phase center uh, depend on the reflectivity. It's not an absolute measurement, but you have to consider it relatively to what you have in your data. Now, can someone tell me which is P-band, which is L-band, which is X-band? Why? 
Why? Mm -hmm. Correct. Wait, which is P band, which is L band? It's the first one, L band is in the middle by exclusion. Eh? And here you understand also that, so different frequency, they give you different information and all of them, eh, they contribute to see different parts of your forest. But uh, yeah, this we, we will see it later also a bit more in detail. So you see now you have this uh, change of phase center with the frequency, with the wavelength, but of course the phase center does not change also with the with the does not change also with the with the with the frequency but if you have the same frequency changes also with what you have on the ground so what is this we are here in bolivia this is a tandem mix dm so x band so you tend to see your your face center it's more close to the top and then if you look here there are some patterns which are regular Maybe we can have a zoom. So here the satellite was not broken, so it was still working. This is deforestation. It's one way with which you can get deforestation. And then you see what happens basically. Look at this, this part here. You see that basically you have, you follow like the a sort of canopy roughness with expand since you don't penetrate. Then you follow the height variation of the canopy in space. So this is a fully developed canopy in this forest. And therefore, you see that this roughness, it's pretty high. And then what happens? Where is deforestated? Of course, the deforestation occurs along straight line, very precise. Uh, they leave some vegetation. But then you see that everything else, what remains is smoother, because this is the terrain topography. So the terrain below the forest, there is no more forest on top, but it's just terrain. So this phase center information allows you also to see gradients of forest structure. And this, you may have it in a natural forest, but you also may have it in a, you, you may also have it in cases in which you have a managed forest, but also in cases like this, where you have uh, deforestation or locking. And of course, here the frequency plays quite a role, I would say, because for instance, in this case, in this example, it's X band, X band, you don't penetrate, you don't penetrate so much. So as I said before, you follow the top. If it was a different frequency, then maybe this difference here was not so striking. So now we know what we have in interferometry. We have explored how the coherence change with the capacitor. We have seen now uh, what happens with the phase. We have seen now what do you gain when you have more acquisition. And now we need to put polarimetry in the game. And we said at the beginning, the way to put polarimetry is basically, so you have, so let's stay on the single baseline case. So you have one baseline, you have polarimetric acquisitions at the two extreme of the baseline. And uh, what you do, you just combine polarimetric channels at the two extreme in order to optimize something. So this is formalized here. So you start from the first acquisition, you have its own scattering matrix. In the second acquisition, you have its own scattering matrix again. And now from here, from this matrix, you make a, ve a vector basically. This is just an algebraic representation. So it's more formalism. So from this matrix, then you can have your scattering vector. So basically you have here all the different polarizations here. For instance, we consider it a Pauli combination. You make, the the, you make this for the first acquisition, for the second acquisition. And uh, from this vector, if you like to calculate a coherence, the definition of coherence doesn't change, but coherence doesn't use vectors. Coherence use, if you like, scalars. So, so this means from this vector, you have to make a number. And one way to make a number, it's basically to linearly combine all the components. So you make a weighted average of all the components. And the weights of these components are complex numbers. And they are, for instance, in, um, they are, for instance, 
then collected in this uh, scattering mechanism they are called sometimes so this vector crw so you have you may have one vector w for the first acquisition a different vector w for the second acquisition and uh, they give you the combination of all the element of the scattering matrix here and then for instance here you have two examples so now suppose you start from here you like to have for instance, at the end, you like to have HH plus VV. If you start from this Pauli vector, you just need to take the first component. So this means your W vector has a one in the first position and zero elsewhere. And now you can play this game, you know, for whatever uh, channel you like to make. And then with this, now you have this image one image two and right, that you get with these w vectors and then you can calculate the coherence and this is just an algebraic formalization of what i told you before you make the two polarimetric channels and then you calculate the coherence and polins are means making all the possible combinations of them so and then you can get this here so but what is important to say that is that now you can with this scattering mechanisms so this vector w w you can play many games and for instance one game that you can make is to try to look for the w that maximize the coherence or minimize the coherence so you look for the polarimetric channel that gives you the maximum interferometric coherence and the minimum interferometric coherence for instance here you have we start from the same amplitude image of before in hh and uh, now this was the hh coherence so here this is just insar then we make polinsar so we take this w vector and we optimize them and then we look for the optimum w vector that gives you the the, the maximum coherence which is somewhere here and you see that here, here this is significantly larger for instance, that they change coherence. But you can also look for the coherence, which is the lowest. So, and this is represented here, which is also significantly lower than this. And now you see that you have, in, you have an effect on the surfaces. And you see the surfaces here that, of course, they can decrease their coherence, but also on the volume. Now we will see in a moment what this means. But you can also try to optimize your polarimetric channels in a different way. What Polinsar can do, can for instance, so suppose that this, this is your starting polarization. It's a generic W vector. So it's a generic combination, but you can also, oops, you can also go on something like this. So, for instance, you can look for a combination that changes your reflectivity function. Of course, if you change the coherence automatically for the same baseline, you also change the reflectivity function. But you can also be more targeted and, for instance, look for something that increases your volume contribution and decreases the ground. And you can also look for something that increases the ground but decreases the volume. Of course, in an ideal world, we said with polarimetry, I separate scatterers. So, and here I would like to separate the volume from the ground. Can you tell me what happens to the phase center? If you play this game. Exactly. So in principle, what you do, you like to move the phase center. It's not a, exactly the same as changing coherences. So before I was telling you, yes, with this scattering mechanism, you can maximize, minimize the phase. But what you can do, you remember at the very beginning, I was saying what you many times what you like to have. So what you like to consider are the phase differences. So and therefore here you have a case in which what you may like to do to separate scatterers if they are at different heights in this case, for instance, 
then you like to maximize the phase difference. So the difference of the phase centers of the different polarizations. So and therefore you like to have, have the polarimetric channel with the minimum phase and the polarimetric channel with the maximum phase. And you associate them, for instance, in a forest, you will associate them the one with the minimum phase, like the first case will be the one with the uh, scattering closer to the ground, the one with the maximum phase will have the scattering close to the top. Let's make an example again with data. Maybe it, it's a, uh, this is again this first uh, polarimetric interferometric and tomographic acquisition around DLR. So, and this was the very first uh, tomographic profile that was coming from those acquisitions. And here you see you have different uh, you have different part of the scene. You start with the forest, and you have buildings, you have cars, and you have a corner reflector here. You see, this is a Pauli combination. This corner reflector is blue. Is it a dihedral or a trihedral? So, trihedral, exactly. So it's indeed a trihedral in the calibration campus that we have in Nobel Fafenhofen. And uh, now if we, let's go into the forest, maybe before going into the forest, we go on a surface. And we say, let's stay on a surface and a change polarimetric channel. So these are reflectivity profiles from the data. So it's the distribution of the, of the backscattered power along height and evaluated for different polarimetric channels. So there is no optimization yet. So we have HH, VV, HV, and then we have the Pauli channel. So you have one, it's a surface. So you have one dominant contribution here, and this stays there for every channel. What you change is just the amplitude here. So when you see, for instance, in HH and VV here, it's essentially the same. There is a maybe in VV it's a bit stronger as you like to expect, but not so much in this case. In HV it's weaker. And then if you like, you can also go ahead with the Pauli, but you essentially see the same. Now, what is important to observe here is that, for instance, uh, by uh, essentially in a surface, you change polarization here, your profile doesn't change. We will see later what it may change. So what does the polarimetry do there? You, you can already imagine. So if you don't change the profile, means that you don't change the phase center. So what you change is just the coherence magnitude. And on a surface, what makes your coherence magnitude change? So you have no temporal decorrelation, which contribution remains? So we said we have three. The signal to noise ratio, exactly. So in principle, you see that there in a surface, you play this game with the polarization, but what you can win, you can win some signal to noise ratio. So you can optimize against your system effects. So you don't optimize the phase because there is nothing to optimize because you don't have a profile basically, but you optimize the coherence magnitude. So you play against the signal to noise ratio. Let's go in a forest. Now this becomes a bit more interesting. So even here, of course, you can play with the magnitude, but then you see what happens across the different polarimetric channels. So that's a ground again. And that's your volume. And this, it's a, it was a stand, it's around between 15 and 20 meters. And the height matched pretty well what we know. So the data were well processed. And do you see what happens here when you change the polarimetry? What do you change? Someone likes to guess. Just look at the pictures. 
Yes, so you, you have a bit of a better separation. Right? So you see here, for instance, that separation in the sense that you can amplify one contribution with respect to the other. In imaging terms, you play with the contrast. So you see here that, for instance, you make in HH, you make the ground stronger. Yeah? And then to find this stronger ground, or something even stronger, you have to go in HH minus VV. Which kind of scattering mechanism is this? They are the dihedrals, exactly. So they are the dihedrals, the interaction between the three trunks and the ground. Eh? So, and you see it here. On the other hand, then you have to go somewhere here with HV to minimize the ground. And then you amplify the volume. Now, of course, the question arises if you can really cancel the ground or if you can really cancel the volume. That's a difficult question, but already from here, you start to think that maybe this is not possible. You can just minimize the ratio between the two in one direction or in the other, but not to completely cancel them. And this will have an effect then in the assumptions that you make when you end in the modeling, when you like to invert your parameters. So that's a different stand. So it's a, it's, it's a forest, it's a forest stand which is shorter. And uh, it's again the same game, of course, but can you see the difference here, for instance, take HV. So this is what you have in HV. Here you have a difference between the ground and the volume. Here it's around four dBs. And here you don't have not even these two dBs. So if you change forest and so the polarimetry here still works. So the polarimetry still gives you an optimization space in which you can optimize this contrast, this contrast, contrast here between ground and volume in one direction or in the other. But of course, this optimization in this case, it's a bit less effective but still is there in the sense that, for instance, here, you still have a strong ground, but of course, for instance, here, you, uh, your ground, it's quite well separated from the volume on top. So, and this may be, it's associated with the fact that it's a shorter stand, you have a better penetration and so on, but, but this is not the only factor. But in general, the message is, yes, polarimetry is effective. You can, optimize this separation between the scattering mechanism, but you don't have a full separation uh, between them. And this depends on the other things also on the scene that you are watching. So maybe to formalize this, so I guess now you have the concept, unless you have any question or there is something that you didn't understand. So, and to formalize this, we, in Polinsar, we use the concept of coherence region. So the coherence region, basically, so you start again from the vector W, you parameterize this vector W in a number of parameters again, and now you have to play, in principle, you have to generate all the possible vectors W, in order to get all the interferometric coherences. So therefore, this coherence region contains all the interferometric coherence that you can realize by means of this linear combination between the different polarimetric channels. And you see this, this coherence region as an extent, they normally look like this. This is pretty much a regular shape, the shape so the shape is always sort of regular, but it's not necessarily elliptical. So you will see they have different shapes. But the idea is that they have an extent. So they have an extent radial. So the radial extent of the coherence region tells you how much polarimetry can help you to, uh, 
maximize or minimize the, 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 the magnitude of the coherence. And the angular extent of the coherence region tells you how much polarimetry can separate. So in principle, how much polarimetry can optimize the phase difference. So they are in principle associated to two different effects. You remember when you play with the coherence magnitude, with what do you play? With the variance of the phase. So this means you like to optimize coherence in this sense, in the radial sense, if you like to make a good dam. So if you like to estimate a good height, then you need coherence. Because if you have coherence, you have a lower phase uncertainty. So you have a lower uncertainty on the phase center. So you need to go here, somewhere here. But you remember now, when you like to separate scattering mechanism, you like to have phase centers which are far apart as much as possible. So you need to optimize this uh, phase separation here. So, and then in principle, this is what you like to do with polyinser when you like to separate scatterers. You have to go for this. You have to maximize the phase difference. And now, of course, as I was saying before, these are the two different shapes that you may have. For instance, if you have a surface, the shape of the coherence region is basically radial. So you, opti you don't optimize in terms of phase, but you optimize in terms of coherence magnitude. Yeah. So against, for instance, the, the, the signal to noise ratio of your system against your system effects. But for instance, if you are in a forest, yeah, so you have a ground, you have a volume on top, and then you will have, in this case, also an extent. Uh, you will also have an extent here in the angular direction. So the extent in the radial direction, in general, it's not as strong as on surfaces, but it's significantly stronger, of course, in the in the here in the volume here for the phase centers. And in principle, this tells you that in general now, without knowing the scene, this tells if you calculate your coherence region, then here you find out that you can still you, you, every polarization has a different phase center. So of course, there are also cases in which you, you then you, you can start to cry like this. So in principle, when your coherence region is a point. Because this, this means polarimetry tells you nothing. So you cannot optimize in the radial direction. You can opt not optimize in the angular direction. So what's this? It's basically a random volume scattering. So the, 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 you only have then at that point, polarimetry is not an optimization space anymore. Your only optimization space are just the baselines. So baselines and looks, nothing else. Of course, if you like to separate coherent uh, different scattering mechanisms, then there you go, maybe with frequency. So multi-frequency acquisitions. Good. And just to show you an example, again, this is X-band, tandem mix. This is a scene. This is uh, not so far away from DLR. And uh, this is a lake. You see you have forest and non-forested areas, bare fields, basically. So what you have here, it's the coherence. And what you have here, it's basically this extent. This is just dual pole. It's not full pole. Dual pole means for tandem mix HH within. And uh, your phase difference here, it's basically larger on forest, on the forest part. And it's very small on the surfaces. And this is exactly what you would expect. So as we said before. And you see, you can also change your polarimetric space. So you go from a quad pole, 
which is the larger space, the more complete space that you can get. You can go to a to a dual pole, and you still uh, and you still get something. Good. Now let me see where we are, but not here. Maybe. Oh, sorry. Question. Do you have questions before we continue? We still have half an hour before the break. Yes. Can you give us an example of when you have online penetration? For instance, yes. You don't have enough penetration. You see just the volume. And then in that case, you miss the ground. So this is something that you have here. So it would be like this case. So, I mean, no, this case is where you don't have a point, but uh, when you have a point, it's the contrary of this. When in principle, again, it's still like this. So when in principle here, you just have the volume, there is no ground. And then by optimizing, you see always the same volume. This is what happens. Uh, so let's say, so this is a situation that happens when you, increase frequency so if you go towards x band you penetrate if in very dense stands you basically don't penetrate you only have the volume and there your polarimetric information it's not so strong this is a particular case what you see here because here it's a basically temperate forest and uh, you know it's not a dense one so you can still penetrate through the gaps so you still have a ground and therefore, here, even an HHVV configuration can give you something. Other question? So if not, then we continue. So now we start to enter slowly. So we know how to use the interferometric information. We know how to use the polarimetric one, or at least we know what happens when we play with the different uh, interferometric configurations, but also with the different polarimetric channels, what we can expect. And now we enter a bit in the, in the how to say, in the, in the part of this morning in which we start to think how to use this information to invert models and to get parameters of the scene. And of course, these parameters, they are typically parameters which are associated to the 3D distribution of the scatterers in your volume. This depends if you have a forest. And of course, the most typical example of parameter of that you can invert with Polinsar is the forest height, is the one that it's well understood and you know it has a long history and uh, basically was demonstrated with whatever configuration and whatever frequency and so on. Of course, you can get forest structure still with Polinsar and then moving from Polinsar to a tomographic configuration. You can even get biomass, for instance, from Polinsar. If you get height, then you can link height to your biomass. So the taller the stands, the more the biomass content, very, very roughly. And of course, if you penetrate enough with Polinsar, you can also get the underlying topography, which is a product per se. It's a DM basically, but it also helps the inversion also for the other products. And then, you know, this, the, the, this kind of parameters that are used in, 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 in for several, uh, you know, in several cases. You can make the same also for agriculture. 
for agriculture, it's it's a bit of uh, the, of course the, the the parameters of interest change. So there you go towards moisture, for instance. So maybe with pollinators, the fact that you can separate scatters and you can also characterize them polarimetrically it may tell you something about the moisture, the moisture of the ground and the moisture of the vegetation. This doesn't mean that this is easy to get, but potentially you can get it. Uh, you can also, for instance, get the height of the vegetation layer. So this is something that it's there. It has been demonstrated several times. And you can also get soil roughness. When you go to ice, now to ice, it's a bit more complicated, the story, because the development of pollinator application for ice, it's went a bit slower. And this is because of basically the lack of data. So campaigns and data acquisitions of ice in, in pollinator configurations, they are very recent, but it's clear that they can, can contribute. It's somewhat symmetric like the forest in terms of, for instance, for the structure, the vertical structure. And here we speak about high structure. Of course, a, a product which is normally, uh, a product which is normally uh, looked for is the penetration depth. So how much you penetrate, and this is also uh, in terms, uh, people use it, for instance, to correct DMs, but also to, to, but also, for instance, to get indications about density. Uh, uh, then, of course, there is not only uh, snow, but there is also, sorry, there is not only ice, but also snow. And therefore, you know, you, you may, you might be interested in the thickness of the snow layer. I think you, you will see something about snow in the exercise and in the applications of tomorrow. And then also the snow water equivalent. So, of course, what we see this morning here is just a, a, a is just a, a, a subspace of what we have here, but just be aware that, you know, you have all this wide range of applications. And of course, in terms of systems, so of course you have airborne acquisitions that in uh, for, for, for polincer configurations, they're easy to get because they're also more under control in terms, for instance, on the baselines that you can realize. You can also have, however, space-borne acquisitions. So and the, there is a number of sensors that have, so let's say, so the, the, you have here, for instance, this uh, tandem mix, of course, this is a purely interferometric mission. It was not born for Polinsar because the, the purpose of tandem mix was and is to get DMs, but it demonstrated also a potential in many Polinsar applications. We will see some example later and we will make, we will use also tandem mix data during the exercise this afternoon. Then of course you have ALOS. Uh, ALOS has uh, polarimetric capabilities. Of course, the revisit time, it's maybe not so ideal, but still with temporal decorrelation, but you can get something maybe. Not everywhere, not systematic, but still you can get something. Then there was, or there is still rather sat Sentinel. Sentinel has interferometric capability. The problem of Sentinel is, however, that baselines are not there. So you have to, depending on what you like to do, you have to struggle to find acquisitions with the right baselines. So it's, it was a mission more for the, most, for the formation, but still you can get something, at least also for polarimetry. Now recently there is also SAUCOM at L band, there is RISAT at C band, and uh, this is going to increase more and more. So you have the RADARSAT constellation, which is actually still there, biomass, so biomass, it's close to launch, it's P-band, and uh, biomass, it's, I think, the first mission that implements Polinsar and also tomography, polarimetric tomography, in a systematic way. So you will get it at least around the tropics, you will get all these acquisitions, so quad pole with baselines and everything designed, for instance, for forests. There is NICER, L-band, it will be launched, this one too. And uh, with some polarimetry, again, this, the, the baselines, they, they are not there systematically, but they will maybe, they are still thinking about configurations 
uh, with which they can have some baselines, the same also for Roselle from ESA. And of course, the future will be uh, with it's going more and more towards emissions with polarimetric companions. I think about the, the, the harmony case in which you have two companions which will fly together with one of the sentinels. And these companions basically realize an interferometric pair. So this is going, this is uh, uh, something that you know we will see more and more in the future. And then, of course, there is also the DLR proposal tandem L, which is uh, this time L band. And again, it's a systematic implementation of polyinsert and tomographic acquisitions, but be static. So it's like tandem mix, but at L band and with more and more baselines. So we will see if this would be realized or not. Anyway, so you see, around there is data and there will be more and more data where interferometry and polarimetry will play a bigger and bigger role. Good, so therefore, now we start maybe with the most complicated part, maybe, I don't know. So we have 15 minutes before the break. Question is how tired you are? Do you like to have the break now? And then before starting this, I don't know what's good to do. How do you feel? Do you feel fit to have 15 minutes or we should take a rest? Who likes to have a break now? <laughs> Still few people. People like polinsar, more polinsar than coffee. Okay, no, then we continue and we stay on the, and we then stop at 10, 15 sharp. So modeling. Uh, where do we start? Again, guess from where we start, from the interferometric coherence. It's a complex number, so we know it. You have a magnitude and you have a phase. And uh, we know that what we, in principle, for the moment, let's leave the, the, the system, the correlation from one side. So this basically comes from the system and from the processing of your data. What you have, you have time, so the temporal decorrelation and the volume decorrelation. And then you have this relationship. So the, the Fourier relationship, the link, the vertical reflectivity function, and the coherence. So these are the three, basically the three ingredients that we have and we need to consider to develop models that we can use basically to have, we can use in this relationship here, then to invert parameters of the vertical reflectivity starting from the coherences. There is one thing that we need to take into account. So is the fact that basically the, 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 the reflectivity that you have here, it's the reflectivity that is seen by the radar which means that this reflectivity changes. It changes with the frequency. It changes with the, um, it changes with the, uh, of course, the polarization channel, and it changes with the incidence angle. And if you like, if it's a forest, it changes also with the water that you have in the trees. So because it changes the attenuation. So this means that your modeling should take care of all this variation. And the parameter that you retrieve then from your coherences, they are constrained by this model. So in principle, they are constrained by what you see in that configuration and for that wavelength. So, and your ability to estimate these parameters, and if you like also the significance of these parameters depends on your ability to describe this vertical reflectivity function and to parameterize it. That's the one. And when it comes to the inversion, since this reflectivity function, it's basically here in the volume decorrelation, you have to take care about this temporal decorrelation. So one point that I'd like to make now, and then this we will have it also later, is that the fact that you have temporal decorrelation does not mean that you cannot invert your data. So 
you can still invert the data, invert your coherence for your parameters, provided that you take into account this coherence, this temporal decorrelation. So what is more important is that if you like to invert your structural parameter, you need to have a volume decorrelation. And to have a volume decorrelation, you need a baseline. So temporal decorrelation is not so critical as long as it's not too low. But the, 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 the availability of a baseline is extremely critical because without a baseline, you have no inversion at all. So this is, you will see this later also in an example. Good, then. Uh, okay, so how do we model? There is a model that was proposed several years ago and is still valid and still used which is basically a two-layer model. You saw it already from the reflectivity profiles of before. We were speaking about the ground and the volume and not a lot more. So, and indeed this two-layer model, so considering a volume above a ground, it's the main ingredient of all the inversions that you have. So, and uh, you can describe it like this. So if this is the reflectivity, you have your volume layer and you have your ground layer here. The ground layer is a Dirac delta. Is this basically shape, this reflectivity with this shape, which is very concentrated at the ground. The volume layer, it's something which is more generic. Of course, this reflectivity here that you have depends on the electromagnetic properties of the different physical uh, elements, scattering elements that you have here. Right? So you have also to take this into account. And then in principle, now you have this reflectivity. What depends on polarimetry? So, and now here, uh, this depends a bit on what you are watching. But if it's a forest, a model that works pretty well, it's the random volume over ground. So in principle, you assume that what is actually changing is the ground with polarimetry. So it's the power of the ground here. The volume stays the same, also the power of the volume stays the same, but it's the power of the ground that is changing. But the reflectivity profiles, they don't. So they are the same. So if the reflectivity profiles are the same, then also the associated coherences are the same with polarization. And this is a trick which is quite important because will allow you, for instance, if you play well now this part with this, and you have a clever way to parameterize this, the, 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 the volume function, then you can get your parameters even with one single baseline. So then in principle, now you have this reflectivity model, you have to plug everything in your integrals, and then you get this well-known equation. Eh? You have basically, this is your ground topography, and then this is the coherence of the volume only, and then this is the ground to so-called ground to volume ratio. So this is, it's the ratio between the power of the ground and the power of the volume. What depends on the baseline? The volume coherence. The ground not. So the ground does not depend on the baseline, so it doesn't decorrelate when you increase your capacitor, but it depends on the polarimetric channel. So in terms of structural parameters, so your structure, you, in principle, so of course you have the ground phase here, but when it comes to the volume, all the structural parameters that you have are here in the volume only. For the rest, it's just a ratio of powers. And, So, in terms of unknowns, what do we have? So we have, suppose that you have one single baseline. Unknowns are, of course, suppose that we are in a forest. So you have the volume height, good. Then you have the topography, and then you have the ground to volume ratio. So you already have three parameters. And, on top of these three parameters, you have to put all the parameters that give you the, the, the volume, the volume reflectivity. In general, they are N, 
three plus n. And then on top of it, if you have temporal decorrelation, you have one more, which is gamma temp, so the temporal decorrelation itself. So three plus one plus n, four plus n. So single baseline, one coherence. One coherence, how many numbers? Two, because you have an amplitude and a phase. So you have then two measurements against four plus n unknowns. And you understand you cannot do this. Or better, you can, but you are ambiguous. So, how, and this already by supposing, so by assuming the fact that it's only the ground changing with polarization. So the polarization is here is still not there. So basically what plays here more is the fact that you see that your ground reflectivity is not changed. So your ground coherence is not changing with the baseline. So it's always one. So already having this, you don't make it. And then now why you need polarimetry? Because now you can consider the variability of this parameter with polarimetry, and then you can get to a balance problem. So what change with polarimetry? So first of all, how many measurements you have to polarimetry? Well, it depends on how many polarimetric channels you have. If you have one polarimetric channels, you have one measurements, uh, sorry, one number, one complex number, two measurements. Dual pole, four measurements, because you have two coherences times two makes four, then quad pole, six, because HV and VH, they're basically the same apart from the noise. So you have six measurements and you are still now outbalanced or maybe outbalanced eh? because you have three plus N. So HV is the same for all the polarimetric channels. It's a physical parameter. It cannot change with polarimetry. The topography, the same, cannot change with polarimetry. So this is true. Ground to volume ratio. Well, this you have it actually change with polarimetry. So if you are in a quad pole case, you have three polarimetric channels. You have, in this case, three ground to volume ratios. So you are at five unknowns. And in a quad pole case, you have six measurements. How many parameters can you spend for the volume? So you have six measurements, five unknowns, then you can spend one parameter more to model the volume. And this is why uh, what you do, it's basically you parameterize your volume as an exponential. So it's an attenuation. So this means then you have one parameter only. And... Uh, at this point, you have a balance problem. Even with a single baseline, quad pole acquisition, you can invert height. This is, of course, already simplifying a bit the story. Let's see what we have next. There is also something more, which is that, of course, the fact that you have a determined inversion problem doesn't mean that your solution is unique. So you need basically to regularize your inversion so that the solution is unique. There are several ways to do it. This is not so important today, but in principle, you can make it. Still, you can optimize your polarimetric channel. You can distinguish, you, you can look for the one where, for instance, you have no ground. So you kill some parameters more and you say the coherence that I have in that channel is just the volume. And there you invert the parameters that remain. So that's very roughly what is done. But just now to send you to the coffee break, still with some real data. So this inversion, polarimetric interferometric inversion, with this random volume of a ground model, just by using a exponential reflectivity function, was attempted here. This is the Traunstein forest, south of Germany. So you see here, basically, it's a temperate forest. You, are, you have stands which are, or which were, up to 50 meters. And uh, this is the forest height that we got by inverting with Polinsar. It is good or bad? 
we validated against the LiDAR in some selected stents. And this is what we got. This is maybe one of the best results that we got. So in principle, you have <clears throat> the, the root mean square error here, it's well below the 10% of the total range of variation of height. This is, of course, it's a bit optimistic. It's not always like this, but it's something that you can get. This was an inversion in 2003. After five years, same forest, the same inversion, you see here that you have a hole. This was a storm that basically blew down the whole forest. And if here you see that basically you didn't have forest anymore, somewhere else, here you see some management, so the taller trees are disappearing. But here there are stands, for instance, this one, in which you see a regrowth, which is something that after five years you also expect to have. So this kind of inversion gives you not only so accurate height or at least accurate enough for, a, for, for, for the users, accurate inversions, but they also give you the possibility to get changes. Of course, the performance could be an issue, but in general, you can get this. Good. Now, with this example, I would say now, yes, it's time for the break. And we see half an hour on. Then we continue then later. If you have questions, just stop me. I have a question regarding the last yeah. slide. This change study for the modeling, did you use the same uh, parameters? Yes. Did you use the same parameters? So this means different pixels, different pixels, but so it's but it's fully adaptive everywhere, and it's simple enough to take this whatever you can. Now here, of course, you see in this case where you see. So, in principle, here yeah, we it's not the state statement because of the story. It is easy because from you go from everything to nothing. Mm -hmm. And you don't even need to estimate. What is a bit more challenging is to see here the regrowth and to be accurate here. Because of course, if you can think of now that this is the same thing, it can have a one change, which is bigger than the other. You don't see one meter changes, but for instance, you may see this five meter change. In five years, it will stand as that going up. Mm -hmm. okay. But this is an optimistic result. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your question. No, because oh. I wanted to answer the whole problem. <laughs> Uh, I actually have uh, just for the basic question. So on the first day we had the um, tomographic survey, and now we have this uh, polarimetric interferometry. So I'm a bit confused um, in, in, in the definitions at the moment. Like mm -hmm. if we say SAR, then we mean that it is SAR uh, inter uh, polarimetry. Is that correct? No, it, it, it's also you. Polarimetry, it's of course you need to have polarimetric acquisition. Ah, okay, yeah. Then we, they, they don't come always. Yeah, okay. So, depends on the system. so yeah, what is when we do have them, then it is uh, then uh, then this correct. And then in case of uh, demography, so as far as I understood, it is basically provides more like uh, depending on the height they can, so you can have uh, like. Yeah, in case of the forest, we have like ground and then the like some of the middle of the trees and top of the trees. And then the what will the pole wings are to 
it won't give layer by layer uh, data, but it will give like the three D profile. In a sense. Is, this I will I will then try to explain it later. I hope I will have time. The idea yeah. is that so let's say so. The difference between the answer of the is German layers of the fact that with Polinsat, we have the model, we the model to the main dimension. Okay. And the fact that with the model to the dimension, as you say, it allows you to get also this stratification. Mm -hmm. so you start from the down and you go up. So it's like you got a cave. No, no, no. instead of just with Pauline, sir, you don't get this certification in this way, but you can still invent the model. In the so you can express your profiles in terms of a number of parameters. Mm -hmm. You invent for the parameters. And then, because here now, this example here, you are in the forest type. Yes. But you, your parameter could be also something else in this case. You get the forest type here, you parameterize your profile with your extension. Um, and now, when you invert, you get both. You have the divide and extension. So you can go to your profile by using this algorithm. You have the formula, you have your forest in the formula, and you get your profile. The question is if you are happy or not with such a representation. Mm -hmm. This helps us. On. Uh, would be also uh, correct to say that, like in case of pollen star, also if you want to have this profile, then the frequency should basically depend on what we want to profile. Yes. Yeah. And yes. then the frequency is important. And then also in case of uh, again, like uh, coming back to sort of uh, differences differences between tomography and this uh, pollen star. Uh, would it be true to say that for tomography, we probably want to have a uh, higher frequency than for Pauline's art because tomography should like penetrate like the one of the forest, for example, um, or it also depends. No, maybe you wanted to say you like to have lower frequency, but uh, let's say so. This, I guess this is also, Again, it depends on what you like to see. Of course, oh, yeah. if you penetrate, the more you penetrate, the more spending money to make a demographic acquisition makes sense. Because then you have profiles, you have profiles, and otherwise you saw it. In that case, so suppose that you don't penetrate that much, you can get your exactly your same information with just an interferometric or an electric interferometric acquisition. Of course, maybe you don't need a vertical of profile. Yeah, exactly. but you just need the information horizontally for the example that I was showing you there, the deforestation. So, for so maybe the fact that you are sensitive to the canopy top without penetrating, this is a very structural approach. Yeah, and in that x one case, you don't need the model. Yeah, exactly. That, that's what I wanted to say. Just like it, it because depends. in this exactly. case, no, it depends what you it depends what you like to see. So, yeah. The, the, the frequency that you choose, and then also the way you process your data. Yes, everything is in this moment. Well, last question. Uh, those picture of the like polling SAR current sort of missions that we have on the orbit, there was Sentinel 1 mentioned, but Sentinel 1 actually, uh, well, currently it's only one satellite and it's every time it is over the same actually place. So you're not getting any like baseline. Right? Yes, but then there are some very small baselines, but I know people is struggling a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in general, it's uh, yeah. so that's a it's basically a zero base dimension sure. because it was planned for the formation. We have, what I'm, I'm not speaking about here is the differential one in which you still look in the in the resolution cell, but you don't look for high value. You don't look for generations for movements. The movements are not in the resolution. That's what sentiment does. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, 
we talked about the brighter pixels in the in the in the near range than in the but uh, this is the should be uh, corrected in a significant range no? and yes in, you can uh, you can correct it of course and you can add. Should we correct it or we can depend on what you want to see? I prefer to see things like that. So let's say so you already have uh, uh, no, let's say so there are two kind of validation. So you have the one when you get the data, you take into account the difference of range in the start and then in the generation of the It's a convention. What you don't correct is the radiation pattern that has happened. This is going to be or at least normally in the images you still have it. So the fact that the radiation pattern depends on the incidence. What you correct are all the system and the condition, but not the scatter. So when you get an image, you have this. You also need to make some sort of assumption of what scattering, right? To correct fully for that, because some things will have more. Exactly. Angle dependent scattering. Exactly. So the, it's a uh, it's a uh, scattering. So we it's can... sort of this of this sort of correction they are scattering. Ah, right. Because I'm, so I I started them... working with uh, with Aros uh, Aros Baxter data, so uh, polarimetry software for the validation of uh, the data set, and we have this uh, it's really bright in the near range and uh, and. Uh, yeah, in yeah. some sense, in some data sets, it's really the uh, yes, yes, of course. If you like, you can correct for it, but then you assume already the previous argument. So, we cannot, uh, so the yeah. polarimetric composition will not have a uh, meaning anymore. No, they will have it, but this is just one thing. Yeah. 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 Because in the year uh, uh, two, there is the radiometric calibration, but in, uh, uh, concerning Alos Palsa, it said that uh, uh, they only do like the like constant. Like so, no, we are in the so I if we have a very rough surface, then it has been started Mm -hmm. Of course, if it's very smooth, then it's a middle test. Yeah. 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 So we struggle a lot with before system data to start to look at. So, and the, and but go to interferometry. In interferometry, you don't care about that. You normalize the yeah. 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 <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I have a question about say when you show that increase in the baseline to have a decrease in coherence but in volume but then it, it goes up again yeah. what's the physical interpretation of, of that do you have any kind of... no I guess the physical interpretation is driven by this Fourier relation okay so it's, I was struggling to because most of the other things I have some sort of no it's just work. The, the Fourier relation you have this Fourier and so mm -hmm. it comes back and then the, uh, Okay. But then this becomes problematic. Then we will see this after. It becomes problematic when you like to invest, for instance, for parasite. Yeah. Because imagine that you observe a coherence, then it comes back. So you have the same coherence for two different files. So yeah, that was the mix. Okay, but this we will see then in the exercise. I wanted to. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, I wanted to. Um, like, it wasn't a specific question. I just wanted like to tell you about what I do and like what I, if I can use some of these tools for my problem, 
So I work on like um, deforestation monitoring. Uh -huh. So I want to detect when deforestation is happening. I'm using uh, Sentinel-1 because the system that I'm working on aims at operating near real time. So we need to like use a good revisit time and like, of course, continuity of acquisition. So from like all the talk, I understood that I'm not really familiar with uh, with all these techniques. So I learned this week for the first time, this concept of not having a baseline. Um, but at the same time, what I was thinking about before is that I am not really fully interested in mapping the height. Yep. I just want to know, yes, forest, no forest. So is there something that I can do considering that I have just two polarizations as well? Because yesterday we talked about polarimetry the whole time and I don't have that kind of information. Mm -hmm. If no, I use Sentinel-1. Of course, you can go that there is a wide literature about changing. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a uh, it's not an easy thing because this is all. There is people that use also temporal interrelation, and what if the monitor basically is the variation of the coherence? Mm -hmm. How we are time is your near time. So you like to know it for two acquisitions, or you like to wait, you can also wait two months and having a second acquisition. Um, the aim is to do better than what already exists, mm -hmm. which is detecting alerts with a three acquisition, three Sentinel one acquisitions delay. So it would be great to, to uh, and most do three, but like. It was what was due to because of course you can you know, the problem is that because you are in this stage where polarimetric now that gives you two channels yeah. which have in polarimetry which are zero coherence on surfaces and the body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, which is the sensor is really <laughs> so that's a big that's a this is what uh, like what is done yes. and what are we are trying to do and see the changes problem is that so this is a change of scattering scattering can be forever so they can also be yeah because your forest is more wet exactly sun. we have a problem that is not really visible all the yeah. time and the, the for the other meters and the correlation mm -hmm. and the same so it's, it's just the same volume mm -hmm. and uh, just the same volume and the principal one acquisition you may have no change so it's the same wet or the same dry or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Or you may have a change in this dry What can also happen is that you have a volume and you have no volume anymore. And this gives you the foundation. So you yeah. have so we just two acquisitions. It's unnatural. With three, then of course you can start. You can then, if you have a time series, you can also observe the temperature. Mm -hmm. And another part. Yeah. 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 There was, I'm aware of people that was trying there. So I have peaks and valleys. Yeah. 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 And they have a model for the ventral acceleration. And then I just need to keep the parameters on this model. And then I am about to change more or change less or the step functions you want to do. There is happening something. Yeah. The problem with this, I will show an example on the, the temporal acceleration does not have a uniform genius. Correlation for convection. So again, you're kind of ambiguous. Okay, I understand. All right. In this sense, done the needs is by having a position without near the trade off. 
this standard mix, we have acquisition for the operation of the body, and you know, it becomes easier to see what the sun is doing. So you don't do it with text pattern because I think it's going to be a surface in the world's delivery side of text pattern, but you do it in a minute. Because you don't have time, you have space, so for the body. Yeah. I don't know. For me, I would first of all try to see on the on the longer series. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Look quite a lot of that too. Um, because it's so noisy. Yeah. It's so very, I, there's a lot of uh, outliers, and like depending on the what they do now, is just like they say, me, so they of what is happening. Like, I mean, they do like an uh, RCR, so like their thing ratio. Yeah. Yes, so they either take a mean of the bad chapter before, then you place yourself in the day that like, interests you. Of course, you move by one day at a time. Yeah. And then you wait three positions and you make a mean. And then you make a Did I have a okay, drop in that scatter or not? This is the, the, the flag. The thing is that not all the drops are so sharp. And plus, there's this seasonality of the court so that sometimes it's mistaken by a drop. Yeah, and it, to, it depends so much on moisture at all. You can't rely yeah, on the bank or being super constant. Uh, yeah, C band is not. Uh, we were at, yeah. I guess the best is better than trying to do optical because then you can't work. optical uh, like the idea is to like use optical as well because when we do have one image like when there's a clear pixel in optical Mm -hmm. Reflectance is almost always tell the truth with yeah. the precision, so like the MPI drops very, very, yeah. very much. The problem is that you have one clear pixel, it can take six months. What? Yeah. what? <laughs> In Gabon, it can take a year. Yeah, because okay. there's just so, like, so many clouds. So, like, this is very interesting. And then, you can so insert it. Again, it's more. <laughs> Yeah, so put more emphasis on why. Yeah, see people like hitting a lot of kind of local models. Yeah. So you see, sometimes you can start hitting a lot of. So you, we can like separate uh, sinusoidal models, and then at some point you get breaking trends and so all of these. Okay. I think they do have quite a lot of these algorithms for optical, like kind of just start hitting local models on parts of the time series. They're quite expensive because you need for each pixel to hit a local model. It's true that like the idea is mm -hmm. we can do like detection with SAR and then even if it's very sporadic when you have an optical uh, image, yeah. you can confirm the change because it stays in reflectance for a long time. Instead, if SAR goes back after three months, you don't see it anymore. Because that's sort of what Brad and Nurse would have done. If they have something like Brad, Brad is it the evasion approach. Yeah. But it's like <laughs> alert, low confidence alert, and then ask they go for Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's a primary issue and then like a, a secondary issue. Yeah, we're looking at it. Uh, we co supervising a uh, master thesis and um, what we're trying to model in the first iteration, we're looking at what um, for our um, historical data, we're looking at comparing RAD, but also the trend. Yeah, the, the other option is to do that like this, like use that yeah. and then add a lot of like circumstantial information, like what uh, trends first trend, uh, first so it can be like a special information if you're closer to a river, closer to a river. Yeah. Or neighbors. So yes. if I know that here it happened, there's an IRJ chance that it's going to happen next to it rather than yeah. in another place. So you kind of like do yeah, this. Spatial yeah, I think it's uh, it yeah. because if it happens now, it's yeah. going to happen for another. That, that's what they said. This is the most not about direct detection, but like just purely for casting the for this risk, which is quite good. Um, yeah, the only problem you would have with that probably is like when you have wind throw because of a big hurricane in the middle of nowhere, which is not worth it. But if you want to see anthropogenic deforestation, which maybe like if you can do something and detect anthropogenic very well, then the other one you'll probably find the big yeah. And you just may take you a bit longer, but you'll find it. Uh, 
uh, anthropogenic one is the one that you're probably more interested because in the other one you can't read really anything to stop it, right? So no, exactly. I'm mean, just the whole point of finding it's that one like the areas that are protected, so yeah. you do that. Exactly. Um, so I think for monitor, you, you really want to do anthropogenic, so you don't really care, right? So, it's a problem. Yeah, it's, it's a problem, but it's a uh, every time there's a problem, like you see, okay, there's an issue. And to be honest, it's not very easy to do better than what has been done. You think that's better because going lower than the reacquisition, of course, raises the like, false alarm. So, it depends on like how much you want to be accurate. And in the Amazon, it's very important to be accurate because. If you event you want to send someone, you're not going to do it for an hour because exactly. it might be there. Exactly. Yeah. Like that. I mean, you, you probably want to be. Yeah, you probably want to be also like you probably want to over predict more than you under predict. Missing the forestation is in some sense more expensive than. But then it depends on the resources you have. You know that. It really depends on like what is the target like because if you want to like, quantify the loss carbon. It doesn't really matter to be like to be able to contact you yeah. as long as you're very precise, it's good. And we do that well already. And we do that well. If you instead want to be very fast, yeah. you have to put like something. Like false alarm, but that is just going on. There's not much to do as long as we have this kind of information. But the full integration of Sentinel One and Two is not being done. Like Brad, you could do something like you could do something like well, if you have if you had a massive budget. You could do something yeah, like because you have all these new um, the second one, short one and uh, short wave and, and commercial things. You could do something like if you have an, an alert task an acquisition within a few hours, and then you, you do have a higher resolution, so you can probably either visually interpret instead of sending someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, either yeah. visually interpret or automatically yeah. find yeah, it because okay. they can do a lot of both of those. On which, yeah, yeah, at that yeah. level, you should be able yeah, to tell. Which kind but of also, uh, yeah. they are uh, uh, total uh, expensive. So We've tried. I, I so it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't, don't work on any website yeah. related yet, but with the lesser sites and modeling and done with like scale critical like uh, magnetism and stuff. So we're thinking maybe I could apply some of the things that I learned there. No, of course. No, it's in the The modeling is going to be Yeah. I had that in mind, and it's like, yeah, I was thinking mostly like the, the different steps, like the blood sensitization and everything. You know, but fair enough. <laughs>
So welcome back. I hope you could rest a bit. And I see you are more or less all of you, which means that even if you didn't like the first part, you still like to hear the second part. So good. So I was closing with down here. It's always a bit. Okay. So we were closing with this example, one baseline, L band, quad pole. So you can get, in principle, you have an observation space that allows you to get the accuracy that you need. Now, if we like to make things a bit more complicated, but still interesting. Now, let's see Polinsa from space, tandem mix. Tandem mix is basically these two satellites, which are flying. Um, which are flying in formation. So this means, so they see the same area on ground and while they see the same area on ground, they can measure interferometric coherences with no temporal decorrelation. So if you are able to compensate for all the system effect in your coherences, then you basically have direct access to the, uh, you have a direct access to the, uh, to the volume properties. So, Mm -hmm. And you don't have, or at least you have uh, capabilities for, for, for uh, polarimetry. Basically, I just wanted to make sure that we're still recording. Okay. Um, and I don't think it is, so it's probably good to check. Um, but I don't really know French, so <laughs> I don't know what to press. <laughs> to record again. So let me see here. So okay. I think I think it's okay. You're Great. still recording. That's perfect. So, okay. I'm worrying for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So now I'm okay. That's I did it. Now even without knowing French, I know it's this. So good. So in this case, you don't have for let's say so uh, all the nominal acquisition or all the regular acquisitions of tandem mix, you have no polarimetry, you are single pole HH, you have interferometry, you don't have control of the baseline. As I said before, with tandem mix, the, the purpose was just to collect DMs, so not to make forest height. So this means there was a phase with one baseline. So you have a global coverage with one baseline, a global coverage with a second baseline, but you don't have this capability to adapt the baseline and to you know, optimize your performance. So you have to live with, you have to live with what you get. And uh, the challenge is also to move slide. 
to bake these images. Come on. Okay. So the challenge is basically to adapt the modeling of before to these new acquisition <laughs> settings. So one pole, one baseline. So one single pole means a complex coherence, two real parameters. So you have two parameters on your modeling that you can spend. So two parameters means that now you have to make assumptions because otherwise, what do you have in one single pole? You have actually four unknown parameters. And this, even with this simplification of this exponential profile, because you have the volume height, you have the topography. Of course, we make the still the assumption that we penetrate until the ground. So it's a very general one. Then uh, we also make, so if you penetrate until the ground, you have ground scattering. So you have a ground to volume ratio. And then you have here the one parameter, the extinction for the volume. Now, of course, your problem is uh, your problem is underdetermined because you have too many unknowns. You have too many unknowns for the uh, you have too many unknowns for the measurements that you have. Now that's a bit annoying. Okay, so the first thing is that of course you are with the mix. So, and now in your general formulation of the coherence, you don't have any more the temporal decorrelation. So, and this, if you thought even to include temporal decorrelation in the unknowns, now you don't have it anymore. Good for you. The second thing now, X band, uh, what should I say? <laughs> Let's say that we don't penetrate. So if we don't penetrate, then at this point, what do you kill? You kill in your model, the ground layer. Now you are only with the volume. So you only, you only need to consider the volume parameter. So, which means that you don't have anymore also the ground to volume ratio. Your coherence now has this shape, this shape here. You still have a ground phase, however. So, and now your unknowns are, so you have the ground phase, you have the volume height and the parameter for the volume profile or the volume reflectivity. So you have three unknown parameters and one complex coherence, so two numbers. You are still out balanced by one parameter. However, what happens? It happens that if you know the topography, then you can invert. And your inversion, it's basically unique. And here you also have a different, you also have an additional advantage of using the ground topography. The additional advantage is that now you also don't care if you penetrate or not. So you just assume that you don't have a ground scattering, but with the topography, you know basically where your volume reflectivity is located in height. So this means penetration is not an issue anymore, even if you are at x -band. And this is what, for instance, you can do in mangroves. Why? Because of course you understand that assuming that you have, uh, you know, the topography means that someone gave you, uh, 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 um, someone gave you a DM of your ground. Now, if there is maybe two cases in which you can survive also without a DM, still trying to use the phase, but surviving without using a DM. The first one is when your topography is flat. And one case, of course, one case of your flat topography, they are mangroves because they are on, 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 on uh, water. So you can basically here at the border between forest and water, you can estimate your water level. And you can use this then to invert height. And this was an experiment that was done by processing uh, 24 
tandem mix acquisition in this mangrove site in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, Bangladesh. And you see, so you get this kind of performance. So when you compare the radar with the LiDAR, so the tandem mix heights with the LiDAR, this is also a very impressive performance. But this is, of course, is a particular case. And then the question is, what do you do when you, your topography is not flat? You are, you, are, you are not in a forest on the water, so you cannot even estimate your topography. But you still, uh, you still like to get your height. So the first thing that you need to do, basically, is to parameterize. So you always have this out balance problem. Eh? So you have these uh, three real unknowns against one complex measurements. So three parameters on the one side, the two parameters on the other side. And uh, you like to reduce the parameters. Now we are still in the case in which maybe we know to to the topography, maybe not, but one way in which you can still reduce the number of unknowns, it's by parameterizing, parameterizing the vertical reflectivity. Now, if you consider the specific frequency X band, so maybe you can think that the reflectivity, the X band reflectivity is not so different from a LIDAR reflectance profile. And this is a case which has a, a, a practical applicability because you have this tandem mix acquisition. And now in the last four or five years, there was JEDI. JEDI was a, a LIDAR, spaceborne LIDAR, was installed on the, on, the, on the International Space Station and was acquiring LIDAR waveform on ground, from space. The problem is that, of course, you don't have a LIDAR waveform from, for every pixel, for every tandem mix pixel. So the JDI has every LIDAR instrument is just a sampling instrument, it's not a mapping one. So in principle, now you have to find a way to extend the, your, your reflectance profile from this sampling position over the whole tandem mix coverage. There are possibilities. So, And then this is what I was telling you. This is how a JDI pattern look like. So in principle, suppose that you have your tandem X cover this part here. And then in this, in the whole scene, you have this uh, JDI footprints. In principle, you can take all the profiles and you basically need to find within all the profiles, if you like to know the reflectivity that you have here where you don't have LiDAR profiles, where basically in principle, you have to find a sort of mean profile. So which are the mean characteristics in terms of LiDAR profiles of this test site? So here we were doing this by playing a bit with the uh, eigen decomposition of a profile matrix. This is a bit of a detail you find in the detail. But in principle, what you find out is that you have a set of eigenfunctions. So with eigenvectors. So you take all the profiles, you put them in a matrix, and then you calculate the product of this matrix with itself. And then you make an eigen decomposition. And the eigenvectors basically tells you which functions are weighted more to get, in the end, this profile matrix. And for instance, the first one corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. So this means it's the one which is most dominant with respect to the others. And then for us, this very first one, it's the profile that represent the characteristic of the tandemic scenes. So it's an assumption, because of course you should consider also the other eigenfunctions to be able to adapt this locally. But the idea is that in this way, you fix a profile for an entire scene. 
With respect to the exponential function, you lose the adaptivity, but you also gain an unknown parameter. So yeah, now you have one unknown less. And already this gives you the, uh, a balance problem. So you have now your unknowns are just the ground topography and the height. Then we apply this, then with this profile, you can calculate then your coherence, compare it with the coherences that you have from the tandem mix data and try to invert for height. We will see how to do this then in the exercise this afternoon. So then we had this, for instance, this scene, set of scenes in Gabon. So these are the Jedi uh, acquisitions where they are. There are just 60,000 Jedi acquisitions. Now, then here, this is the area covered by the tandem mix acquisition, that, that's the coherence, and that's the forest height that we get. Of course, here we didn't estimate topography. We don't need to estimate topography. We kill the phase. We just consider the uh, coherence magnitude. So in your model, then you don't have the phase anymore. Eh? So you stay with the magnitude. And we will see this afternoon what this means in terms of performance. But basically, we could invert all these scenes here, all these scenes here, this coherence here with just this profile, get this height, and get this performance. Of course, so this performance here is conditioned by many factors. So, for instance, the fact that with one profile you try to uh, describe an entire scene, so forest ends with different characteristics. You that's the one. The second one is that, of course, you use a lidar profile, but X band profile they might be similar to lidar profiles, but they are not lidar profiles. So the, you also have differences in this. Then, of course, that uh, the other fact is that you are inverting this with just one coherence. So, and depending on the coherence, you have a certain variance and so on. What we have seen at the very beginning of this morning, which gives you this variance here, basically. But the important result is that even if you are at X band, just by considering the right profile, and even by using this single profile everywhere, you have an almost unbiased inversion with its error, but it's unbiased. And therefore, this gives you the possibility to get forest height on a very large scale, even countrywide. And then we like to test further this, and then we move from just Gabon. We, we went to the Amazon and we repeated the experiment by processing all the acquisitions in the Amazon. Still with the JEDI waveforms, then we got a mean profile with the JEDI waveforms. And basically for every time the mix seen, there was a mean profile. So here you have, I don't know, I don't know how many, but you know, for sure several. Uh, if you see here, this there around how many degrees? So no, you don't see it, this is 45. 55, this will be 65, these are 10 degrees in, in, in uh, longitude, and these are around other 10 degrees latitude. So it's quite a wide area in the Amazon. These are the JDI acquisitions that you have. We speak about 60 millions of profiles. And this is the tandem mix height. And now you can, of course, compare it with the JDI data that you have, and you see that you are already consistent, but more importantly, you fill the gaps. And this is a height map at 25 meters. So again, we can validate it. You see, you have an error, of course, you have a variance, but you are not biased. It is so globally on this wide area. Of course, locally, you might be biased. Here, despite all the efforts, you still see that you may have, you still see the tandem mix strips. And this is because between strip and strip, you may have a different of incidence angle, but you are processing them with similar LIDAR profile. So the, 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 the profile that you use to model your reflectivity is actually not taking care or, or, or not considering well enough 
the variation of incidence angle. So, and this mismatch, of course, gives you a bias in the height estimates. For instance, here, compared to here. So, but in general, if you are able then to apply corrections for this, then you have a, already a product. There are several other products of this kind, forest height maps from uh, fusion of radar data with other data, for instance, even with the Sentinel-2. The advantage, we have made comparison. The advantage of this with tandem mix is that, of course, you are unbiased, but also you see heights for the whole range of variation. So with, the, with other type of sensors, you normally are more constrained on this. And this is the power of interferometry. So the fact that through interferometry, you have direct access. Of course, if you have a baseline, so you have direct access to the vertical properties and uh, say distribution of the scattering. Of course, now you can extend the same also to agriculture. For instance, as I said before, there, there is a quite a, a, a there is quite a, a number of experiments going to to, to get uh, structure height. You have to take into account a number of differences. So one thing is if you model forest, one thing if you model agricultural crops. So and for instance, in forest, so you you don't consider orientation effects because you have so many elements, so many branches that in principle, you don't have a mean orientation of them, but this is not the same for the agricultural vegetation. Thinks about, think about all the stems of these big crops. So you have them there. So your vegetation is in general shorter. So you have a, a larger contribution of the ground scattering also at larger frequency, even at X1. In forest, maybe you can neglect. In agricultural crops, in many cases, you cannot. So this we have seen with the data. So changes in crops are much faster in times. So if you like to have crop maps from space, or and you like to consider some structural parameters, you need all your acquisition in the space of one week. For a forest, you can have it in the space maybe of a season. So you have to take care about this. Otherwise, you have to include in your modeling also the temporal changes. And then, of course, on the if you like, on the same area, you have a much wider change of, of uh, structure in the crop case than in a forest case. So even this means that your modeling should take into account also this larger uh, spatial variability. But in any case, you can still go for height. And for instance, this is a case, so depending on the, during the phenological stage, so the red is the height that was estimated with Polinsar. And this dashed line is what was measured on the ground. So in principle, you still see, you see that you have a, 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 a rather, uh, you have quite a consistency between what you estimate and what you measure on ground. And you can follow the full phenological stage from beginning to the end. What is also interesting is that these estimates, they give you also the representation of what you have on ground. So if you don't have a, an homogeneous volume, but within the field, you have some areas in which your crops, for some reason, they, may, they bend, then this is reflected also in the height that you estimate. So, and this, it's also across species. So you see, you can, with this, Polinsar modeling, you can take into account a different situation. If your modeling is right, then you, you, you can get to these sensitive results. Of course, I was mentioning before the frequency effects that you have to take into account of the modeling. And uh, the, 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 the most important one, this we saw it with the example before, so is uh, the attenuation of the volume. 
so you can start so in principle you 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 change your frequency so suppose that you decrease the frequency decreasing frequency means increasing the wavelength which means that you are penetrating more so if you penetrate more the attenuation of the vegetation decreases that's one effect so this means in your data you have more ground with respect to the volume so it's just a matter of contrast between the two but of course that's the one aspect the other aspect is also that if you change the wavelength also the scatterers that you see they are different because what scatters it's basically must have a size which is comparable to the wavelength that you are using so then this means that if you increase the wavelength then you tend to see also bigger scatterers so it just it's changing frequency does not affect only the attenuation that you have but also in general it would affect also the general shape of the reflectivity function that you like to assume in your model and this means also the parameters might be different so for instance if you have a situation like this at L band then at p-band, you will tend to have something which is closer to the ground. While at x-band, then you reduce the ground. You are sensitive to what is closer to the top. And then here, as we said before, with the mixed data, you can also play the game of having no ground so, or assuming no ground. So, And then this we commented before, so they are just the same profiles. This you see it very clearly. Of course, you have cases you see already changing from L band to S band. This is just L band, it's 20 centimeter wavelength. S band is uh, 10 centimeter wavelength. So you still penetrate. But of course, you may have cases that at X band, you see something a bit more than S band. This can happen. And look at this, in this part here of the ground, this ground here, it's a lot more brighter than here, because this depends also on the water content or what is on top of your vegetation that can also affect the, the attenuation. All these penetration effects, therefore they have to be evaluated in an electromagnetic sense. Good then maybe two words about the correlation so just to clarify this point so we said before the challenge uh, is really to get if you like to invert volume parameters from polinsar the challenge is to get volume decorrelation and here you enter in a zoo because so this is what you observe so your co the, when you calculate your coherence in your coherence you have contribution from the propagation in principle here, contribution from the scatterer. And uh, for instance, here you may in the scatterer, you have also baseline decorrelation, temporal decorrelation. Then you have the volume decorrelation in terms of propagation, for instance, because you are at a lower, so you're, you are a longer wavelength, you propagate through the ionosphere and this give, gives you the sum decorrelation as well. And you can have also system and process in the correlation effects. So you have in the system, you have the SNR. That's typically the, 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 the highest contribution that we have to take into account. But you may also have uh, contribution coming from the quantization of the data, contribution that comes from the processing, because maybe your two interferometric images, they are not well co-registered, that this gives you the correlation as well. You see, really, in this, this is what you measure. This is how you can factorize. And this is what all the factors which are behind this. So the volume is just here. And you have to take care of all of this. As I said, many of them, they are taken care of just by having a good processing. So, and then in the end, you can still leave. So, so you just need to take into account signal to noise ratio and temporal decorrelation. And about the temporal decorrelation, 
So just to show you which is the effect. So let's start, for instance, from this amplitude image. So that's your volume coherence. This is what we saw before. Your baseline here, it's short enough. So in principle, you, use, you still distinguish between surfaces and volumes. What happens now, this is, of course, it's your scene, so your height map, as the LiDAR sees it. So here you have your uh, taller stands and your shorter stands all around. And uh, you can also compare this volume coherence with uh, this height, and you find there is a, of course, there is a correspondence between the two. And now what happens if you combine two acquisition taken with a 24 hours difference? So here you have minutes, here you have 10, 24 hours. You see now that the surfaces, basically they continue to stay coherent, even if you have some loss of coherence somewhere, maybe because in one acquisition, that your uh, grass was wetter and the other in the other one was drier, who knows? But in the volume, you see that you have the largest effects. So this means if you go to invert this height map here, sorry, if you go to invert this coherence map here to get height, you may get this. So in principle, you tend to overestimate your height. So and this is because you have an uncompensated decorrelation. So for the same height, you tend to have a lower coherence than what you should have. So this means your parameterization is not taking this into account and therefore you get mistaken. And in this sense, you overestimate your stress. Of course, what you hear now, you can also investigate a bit and you can find out that what is more critical is actually the overestimation that you have in the shorter stance. Because take this. So this is pretty tall. In general, here you have some tall trees somewhere here, here on the border, especially. So, of course, you have a bias, you have an error. But consider the error that you have here on these tall trees and the error that you have here on this shorter one in the middle. So here it's everything red. So what was red basically stays red. What was greenish becomes red. So the height error that you make on the taller stands, it's higher, it's larger. We will see then this afternoon why. It's a, just a matter of uh, sensitivity of your model to this height. And then, of course, you can repeat the experiment also in time. You can go months. This is uh, L-band still. And what do you find? You find that now you calculate your coherences, but between acquisition acquired with, we have here, so here is the same day after one month, after two months. And you see that, of course, you have a loss of coherence. So, which, of course, here you are around, I don't know, between 0 0.2, 0 0.4, which means it's not zero. So if you account for it, maybe you can still do something with a performance loss. This is understood, but you can still do something. So this means uh, that, as I said before, the important is not to have gamma 10 equal one, the important is to have a baseline. So that because it's the baseline that gives you the sensitivity to the, is the baseline that gives you the sensitivity to the, the volume parameters. And maybe to see this better, of course at P-band you stay, temporal decorrelation is a frequency dependent thing. So if you have a longer wavelength, you are sensitive to the bigger scatterers which are the ones that decorrelate less. For instance, imagine that you have wind, so smaller scatterers, so the smaller vegetation elements, it's more likely that they move even with the slightest wind, but the biggest branches, they tend not to move or to stay more steady. So this means if your wavelength is longer, their 
smaller movement, it's basically uh, stays basically in the same ratio with the wavelength. So, and this does not introduce a decorrelation. You see it here that after, still after two months, you have a coherence which is around 0 0.9 here. So you don't, in principle, you don't decorrelate too much. This is with respect to the case of Elban before. And this is what you have in biomass. It's true that in biomass, so you will have data that will be acquired with you know, three days of difference, but they are still in interferometric pair in which the temporal decorrelation will not play. So it's there, but it, uh, it will not destroy at all the parameter inversion. Of course, even at L band, you can, as I was saying before, you can still do something despite the temporal decorrelation. If you can have a baseline, you can still do something. And here, for instance, we were inverting height, having acquisition with a variable time difference. So we have here, for instance, this is 10 minutes of time difference between the two interferometric acquisitions. Okay, performance, we commented before, it's fine. Then after one day, after one day, you have temporal decorrelation, we said before, especially in the shorter stands, you are biased. After five days, five days, are you more biased or less biased? Depends on where you are, but in general, I don't see that the bias, for instance, the bias here, it's so bigger than the bias here. And so this means why? Because temporal decorrelation can also, so it, it's not a, how to say, it's not a, 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 a decay. It can also, the correlation can also come back. So imagine that if you make an acquisition on a forest, and the scatterers that remain the same, you will get the same coherence. Now, if there, if there are scatterers that are moving a bit, but for some reason, so you make one acquisition, after one acquisition, they move, and then the acquisition afterwards, they move a bit less, then you are again in the case, independently on the time difference, it can also be five days, but still, you, 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 you may get an acquisition where the scatterers are basically in the same position. And this is not destroying your inversion. The same for now, in this case with seven days, I think between the two acquisitions here, there was even a rainfall, but then 13 days, there are stands where, for instance, the bias is not too terrible. Of course, you cannot take months eh? because then you also have seasonal effects and so on. And therefore, uh, then in that case, maybe your temporal coherence will not be, uh, will approach zero. And then if, if, it approach, if it approaches zero, then yes, there you are really lost. And now, now we make, I guess, I have half an hour or so. And now we basically beat Pauline, sir, you already know a lot. You know how to invert parameters or at least so we were not going into the details of many things, but I think that you have a view, you know where you put your hands, you know which is the meaning of the different quantities and you know how also uh, which challenges that you have and on what the different things depend. Now the question is, so up to now we were focusing on, on we were focusing on inverting single parameters, for instance, here forest height. What if, is actually the reflectivity, the objective of my inversion. So on Monday, they told you, if you like to estimate reflectivity, then you need many acquisitions. It could be five, there could be 10. So then you apply tomography and then you get your 3D reflectivity profiles. And this is true. Can you do something also with Polinsar? Maybe I don't say that you should do it with one baseline, but maybe instead of one baseline, two baselines. So there are still too few for tomography, but can you get something with Polinsa? Well, in principle, you have the same kind of inversion as now. So it's an inversion problem. You just need to 
model your reflectivity function. The simplest approach is just to decompose your reflectivity function into a number of simpler profiles. So this is your reflectivity prof uh, function that you have here. And then now with this, you decompose it into a number of simpler reflectivity functions. And then you just need to estimate the weights that they have. And then it's just a linear combination. This is also algebraically, it's not a difficult problem to write. So, and there is a solution in it. The problem here, someone can tell me what's the problem. So it's still a problem of modeling, but modeling of what? I guess it's the model of the of the individual components. Because you may have, you may choose sets of components again that describe better your data with a low number of coefficients. Imagine if you have, suppose that you like to do this, uh, you like to make this inversion with a couple of interferometric coherences and uh, two, co for instance, two coherences for real numbers. And this means how many coefficients you can get here. Let's say four. So you still need a balanced inversion problem. And if you like to get four coefficients there, you must be able, if you like to have a, how to say, if you like to have a significant representation of your vertical reflectivity function, it means that also your components must be significant here for this few number of elements. So this means you, you, you must be able to find these functions. How to do this? I don't know, the first attempts were just considering functions that were easier from the inversion point of view, so algebraically. Now, of course, there are someone that says, uh, I don't know, why not to use LIDAR profiles? So with the LIDAR profiles, I already have a description of my volume. Still, LIDAR profiles are not radar reflectivity profiles, but they give me here components that in one way or in the other, I expect to, uh, to make my representation better. So you have still now here this, uh, a bit this game to play. So with tomography, you basically don't need this. So you don't need these functions, but you need acquisitions. Here, you don't need acquisitions, but you need reliable functions. That's a bit the trade-off. Anyway, this was applied also on real data. Here you find an example. You see that, for instance, here for this kind of, this is just a pictorial representation, but these were, uh, I think these were simulated data. Now here, uh, this was, so the, the data were simulating like a uniform volume from the ground up to 10 meters. And this is the reconstruction that you have. So red means high power. So you see that you have this distribution of power, which is almost constant from the ground to the top. While in this case, where you have this kind of tree, where this kind of trees were simulated, then this inversion gives you something of this kind, where your uh, reflectivity is mostly concentrated here towards the top. We have also examples with real data and just with two baselines, we could get these kind of profiles here, uh, still in this Traunstein forest, L band. And then here it's, it's uh, what you see here, basically what is white, it's very bright. And then uh, what is towards black, basically it reduces this brightness. And these reflectivity profiles, of course, in terms of reflectivity profiles, maybe they are not the most beautiful that you can see, but still they allow you to get some information about the forest that you have. Because here, for instance, we knew that we had some major spruce stands, and in principle, you have reflectivity profiles that show you the highest contribution towards the top. 
and uh, they are mature, they are uniform. And in principle, you see also that your profile doesn't change a lot. While here in this mixed forest tense, you also have a spatial variation of the profile. So how accurate this is, it still remains a question, but for sure, it's something that you can, you can start to use this, uh, for instance, for distinguishing stents with different structure. And now just to close, I would like to close the circle with tomography. So now we are on Wednesday, I would like to close the circle with the Monday. So and to see how this polarimetric interferometric concept that we saw today, especially in terms of separation of the scatterers, how do they map in tomography? So in tomography, you remember, you can see tomography as a extension of interferometry in the sense that you don't have one single acquisition, so you have many acquisitions. And with this many acquisitions, you actually sample this. So you remember this, we saw it this morning. So this is the behavior of your interferometric coherence as a function of the vertical wave number. Many acquisitions means being able of having many points on this plot. Having many points means being able just of inverting this relationship here without models. And I think this is beyond the, beyond the, uh, beyond the number of acquisitions. So Polinsa, you can invert your parameter even with one single baseline, you need more than one in general. But beyond this, what is important is that here you can get your structural parameter just with imaging by applying imaging concepts. You don't need a model. And so that's maybe the real difference between Polinsar or multi baseline Polinsar and tomography. So, but still, now you have this profile. Of course, you can get how do you go to, how do you make polarimetric tomography? So you apply this inversion of this Fourier integral here to get a profile in every uh, polarization channel. For instance, you make a profile in HH and with V and one in HV. And then you can combine them like a Pauli. In the end, they are images. They are backscatter. Why not to combine them like a Pauli? And therefore, you can have a representation like this. And now the resolution is not great, the vertical resolution, but you see here that, for instance, your Pauli tend to be reddish here, close to the ground, where you expect to have your dihedral contribution, and greenish, or at least uh, for sure, with some more complicated situation here within the canopy. So, and that's quite, uh, it's uh, basically what we said this morning. So again, we can separate the scatterers in height, and we can then uh, separate them also in terms of scattering characteristics. And of course, now you can apply this polarimetric tomographic concept and this sort of separation in a, also in a wide area. And now this is quite a pictorial moving. You see, I just start to map areas in 3D. So, and in principle, you can get these kind of volumetric representations. So at the moment, this sort of representation, I don't know for what they are useful, for sure to make nice pictures. Mm -hmm. So that's impressive. Now think about, uh, uh, of course, this was an airborne acquisition. Think about now a, a spaceborne system that can do this twice per year. So that's uh, quite a, a, an advancement. So good. Now this we commented many times about these profiles. Of course, the profiles that you get, they are affected by frequency. Now, again, so here you know which is L band and which is P band. We commented before on the same profile. Who tells me which is HH, which is HV, which is a VV? Starts from the frequency that you like and tells me, tell me which is HH, which is VV, 
and which is HV. So let's see. So if you had a single SAR image, how do you recognize the channels? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here, look at this hotel band. You have canopy everywhere. No, you have some good points, but maybe let's put them in an order. I would say so HV. Typically, is the channel. So, if you have a true DSR image, HV is typically the channel where you have the largest contrast between the surfaces and the volume. Surface means the ground. Now, in tomography, in which of them you have the largest contrast between the canopy and the ground? Take the forest data areas here. So where do you have it? You have it here. Larger contrast means the largest difference of power. Are they similar or are they different, the ground and canopy here? Similar. Here. And here. Very different. Huh? So this is maybe HV. And between these two, which is HH, which is VV? What do you have on the ground under the forest? Which kind of scattering mechanism? We saw it also before. Double bounce. In which channels the double bounce is stronger? In HH or in VB? In HH. So, are we right or not? Should we see it? Yes, we are. And you saw, and you see this uh, in the end. With tomography, you have just to map in 3D what you already know in 2D. So the polarimetric models, they are the same. And so and normally when we get data, these are also the first thing that we check. But in principle, you see that they are valid also here. Of course, we were watching L-band, but P-band, it's a, it's a similar story. The problem of P-band is, of course, that you have this large contrast here between the copole and, and the cross pole channel. And uh, of course, it's also quite interesting to see, and this should tell you something about, you remember we were mentioning before uh, the fact that when you use a polyinsert optimization, you like to separate the ground from the volume, for instance, in a forest. But this separation is not perfect. So when you, take the two extremes with this uh, maximum phase difference. So the one with the lower phase, it's not only ground, there is also some volume. And the one with the largest phase, it's not only volume, there is also some ground. But you understand already from here that depending on the frequency, you also change this balance. See, for instance, L-band. Now this is HH, VV, HV. So in principle, you see that here, what is what I was telling you before, you have canopy everywhere. 
So here it's a bit more difficult to cancel the canopy. So to have a, a L band, uh, say, a, a L band optimized polarization with only ground, you will always have some volume in it. At P band, for instance, at least in this forest, at P band, it's a bit different. So when you see here, for instance, just looking at HH, you already imagine that maybe you can optimize and you can here, you can get a polarization where your ground is really, really dominant. But of course, the ground stays everywhere. So it will be more difficult to get a polarization where there is only the volume. So you have to think about all these trade-offs or and all these uh, optimization results also with respect with what you have. So, and uh, especially here, the frequency, it's quite important. Of course, this you can guess also with Polinsar, with tomography, you see, you have basically the same story, but here you visualize it. So what we have, what we have said the first two hours, eh, we are not contradicting anything. It's still here and it's in the data. So now this maybe I can skip. What is also fun and interesting to see, it's uh, the fact that I was mentioning you before, everything depends on the frequency, it depends on the, it depends on the incidence angle. So I mean the, the reflectivity profile that you have and the model that you should use. Depend on the frequency, depend on the incidence angle, depends on your uh, polarimetry. It depends, I was saying, if you are in a forest, it depends also on how much water you have inside the forest, so inside the trees and on top of the trees. And these are, for instance, tomographic profiles, reflectivity profiles, after a number of sunny days. This is still Traunstein, Bavaria. So, and you see here, for instance, in HH, you have the strong response of the ground. Two days after, so we had a second acquisition, and in between there was a rainfall. So, and this rainfall was lasting just until a few hours before the acquisitions. And this is how the profile look like. So, and then you see immediately what? What do you see? What happens after the rain? Don't see the, so, I mean, you see the ground, but it's very attenuated. And this is because, so in principle, you have still water on top of the trees, maybe also inside the trees. And, uh, because of this, you have a larger attenuation. Of course, you cannot distinguish with this, just looking at this attenuation, you cannot distinguish where is this water. So it's, this is something that requires, uh, maybe requires something, some more understanding, some more modeling, or maybe you just, you are just ambiguous. Of course, you can make the same game also with the, you can make the same game also with the seasons. So these are profiles. It's the same forest, the same stands. These are in spring. These are in autumn. In autumn, you see here, so the, the, the water here moves towards the lower compartments. So in principle, there are no leaves already. There is no, the transpiration is lower. So the water tend to move less. It's a very rough explanation but it tells you basically that you are sensitive also to this water content. So, which gives you also a different perspective on these polinsar acquisitions. So, you can localize cutters, you can distinguish them, but you can also see changes. So, and it's uh, when we speak about structure and structural changes, we speak about changes of course, on the physical vegetation element, yes, but also on their water content. And this opens a perspective also for this polarimetric interferometric data, for instance, for water cycle. So it's not only biomass or tree height, but it's also changes in water cycle. So this is something that we have a very limited understanding now, and uh, it will come more and more, I think. Of course, if you are able to distinguish between, uh, if you are able to distinguish between um, 
say, changes due to changes of water inside and on top of the trees and changes due to changes in the structural elements. Uh, this, of course, in space and in time. Then you can also think about characterizing forest structure. So this is something that we attempted. Uh, you see here, for instance, an example with simulated data. For instance, you take a, a young forest. So with a simulator, with a forest simulator, was looking like this. So this here, this is a picture of the trees, how they were looking like. Then we were simulating radar reflectivities. And we, from this radar reflectivity, we got our reflectivity profiles. So here you have height on this vertical axis. And then what you can do to characterize this, of course, you can consider how these different reflectivity profiles look like in consecutive pixels. So this means on ground patches. I don't know how they look like in 50 meters by 50 meters or how they look like in one hectare. And then you see that for this young forest, they are very homogeneous vertically. So you see basically the same appearance of these reflectivity profiles, but also horizontally in the sense that, so they have the same two peaks and these two peaks, basically they don't change when I move here from one profile to the next. Of course, you can start now to play the same game with an older forest where you know there were more competitions going on among the trees and therefore uh, it starts to be a bit more entropic. And here you see you have an increase of the variability of these profiles, both in the vertical and the horizontal direction. Then you may have also a fire event. So, for instance, here it was a very selective file. So you see only squares were burning. Anyway, doesn't matter. And, uh, but what is important here to say is that at this point now, of course, for, for what is surviving after 10 years, you see that you have a certain vertical homogeneity, but it's totally inhomogeneous horizontally. So you have patches without anything. But then if you recover after 200 years, for instance, you have a situation like this. So it goes in the direction of an old forest, but of course it doesn't have, for instance, the same heterogeneity. So this means having this reflectivity profile, you can start to access to, to this horizontal and vertical structure. And if you like, you can also try to map this on a matrix where here you increase the horizontal structure, so the horizontal heterogeneity or complexity, and here the vertical heterogeneity or complexity, and then you see that these different four terms, they occupy a different place in this matrix. So, and therefore, having this reflectivity profile that you can get, of course, you can get with tomography, with polines are still challenging, but you can still get them in one way or in the other. And the uh, and then in principle you can have these structural evaluations. Of course, we did an experiment with real data, but also to try to see changes. And then in terms of vertical structure, we had here this situation in terms of complexity. You see that here on the border, it's rather complex, the vertical structure. So you have many different layers and this is, is uh, indeed matching with these uh, management polygons so, so basically here we know what they do and here on this border they don't do nothing so this is basically a, a, a natural growth but then after five years we calculated the same vertical complexity index which is based on this matrix concept of before, what you see is that there is an increase of complexity more or less everywhere. And the reason is the following. So you move from a homogeneous scenario like this to a less homogeneous one in which, for instance, you cut the tall trees to make the younger ones grow. So to give them space and light. So, and therefore you see that this structural concept, of course, they give you uh, access also to structural changes. Now, to close with, 
of course, I was mentioning that you can see also with tomography, you can extend this Polinsar concept about the separation of the different scattering mechanism also to tomography. And uh, the model is the same. You just need to extend it to, you just need to extend it to the multi-baseline case and to the tomographic coherence matrix. This is something, I don't know, uh, on Monday, maybe we have heard something about it. And uh, it's just now an algebraic game. But what is important is that at the end of this, basically, you can combine all the different acquisitions and get your uh, multi-baseline polarimetric coherence matrix with all the coherences, um, with all the polinsar coherences at all the baselines. And then this means that for every baseline, in principle, you can get a coherence region. And for this coherence region, then you can separate, for instance, the two points, which have the maximum phase difference. Again, but this you make it in a tomographic sense. So what you get, now you have tomographic covariance matrices from which you can get your profile. And the question is, how do they look like? Of course, you have an ambiguity because this separation is ambiguous. It doesn't matter how many baselines you have. You can have one baseline or many baselines, but you have an ambiguity. So you have a, of this separation problem, you have many solutions. So this means you have a, a segment here of solutions. So this means when you move this segment and you go from the most inner point to the point which is closer to the unitary circle, you get this sort of profiles. You see, you tend to cancel more and more the volume. This is if you are in the segment that it's closer to the ground point. So it's nothing different from what we saw this morning or you know, a few minutes ago. So in principle, you have profiles in which the ground is amplified with respect to the volume, but of course you don't have a full cancellation of the volume. You can make the same also on the volume side. So you go on the other side of the coherence regions and look for these tomographic solutions. And you see what? You see that in principle, you see here you, have, you were able here to cancel the ground already. But then if you move, you cancel more and more the ground on this ambiguity space. And you see here, this is L band. And you see, if you compare this at the extreme, at the extremes of your uh, polarimetric solutions, so sorry, you see that you have a different behavior for the ground or for the volume at L band. If you try to get the ground only, uh, you still have some volume here. And here is the same, or better, is the contrary. You go for the volume. And you are able to cancel the ground much better than the volume that you can sell if you like to have the ground on you. Of course, you can compare this between L and P. So you remember before we were just speculating with the profiles in HHVV and HV. And now you have the solution of your separation. So between the ground, so the ground dominated and the volume dominated polarization channels, you see here with the profiles. Instead, we just interferometric phases. And you see a tail band, you can get a quite good volume, but still a ground polarization with still some volume. And with P band, the, uh, the contrary. You can get a quite good ground, but of course, a polarization where the volume is still dominated by the ground. Of course, there is also, and now I like to conclude with this because I was telling you at the beginning that you can basically with polarimetry and interferometry alone, you can start to see what happens in the resolution side. And I was meaning the range azimuth resolution side. Then, uh, of course, you can do this also with tomography. So within the range azimuth resolution cell, then 
you start to get the power at the different heights. So again, you explore the single resolution cell. But what does polarimetry gives you to tomography then? Again, a bit the same concept, but in 3D. So the polarimetry gives you the ability of separating scattering mechanisms within the 3D resolution cell now. So it's not only the 2D, but the 3D resolution cell. Because, for instance, suppose now that you get your ground estimates. So the estimation of the ground power only with tomography, with just a couple. And then you get this two. Now, suppose that you make this for all the polarization channels and you are able to get, there are techniques th that give you the polarimetric covariance matrix of the ground. So now you move from one single power to the full polarimetric characterization. And then you calculate an entropy of the ground below the canopy. And you get something like this. Red entropy close to one. Do you believe it? So it's L band. So maybe, of course, eh, you don't have a, a clean entropy. So you, you, you uh, but close to one, maybe not. So this is because, so with tomography, you are able to, uh, with tomography, you are able to, to separate the different uh, scattering contribution in height but not the different scattering mechanism. So this limited resolution that you have does not give you the possibility to separate, for instance, here the ground from the volume. But when you apply polar, uh, this polarimetric optimization concept, then you enter in a space of this kind. Of course, you have to take into account that this polarimetric optimization comes here in this particular case with an ambiguity. But if you are able to solve this ambiguity, you have a polarimetric space in which your polarimetry still gives you some information. And you see it here, for instance, with this very low entropy at the ground that you can get. So that's why polarimetry gives you the possibility to distinguish scattering mechanisms in 3D if you use it to complement them. Of course, within the same pixel. So we start with the same pixel and we end with the same pixel. Good. I have nothing else to say for this morning. And now it's up to you if you have something to say. So questions, comments. So you don't need to have them now. I'm here also in the afternoon. So many of these things, especially the central part about parameter inversion, we will see then in practice in a simple example later on. So we'll have all the time to implement it and then to discuss it and maybe to review some of this concept maybe also practically, so. Good, then if it seems that it's everything fine, then. Yes. Mm -hmm.